right then, welcome to episode two of uh, Last Man Standing. Say hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I think what we're going to do this week, because we never did it last week, uh, was we're going to introduce ourselves. So uh, I am Stu, I play guitar in Tantrum, and we will just follow the, the videos around. I have no idea what direction it's going to go in on your screen, so who's going to go first? Mm-hmm. I am uh, that'll be you, Steve, from my perspective. <laughs> well, I am Steve, I play also guitars in Tantrum. I'm Billy, I used to play the drums in Tantrum. <laughs> and I'm Richie, I occasionally play bass uh, we, We're not joined by Mr Swanson tonight uh, Our illustrious singer Because he's doing other things <laughs> Yeah. So we're going to have a couple of drinks again tonight Keep everybody entertained That's watching I wonder so, if it would be Round upon the drink Non-alcoholic beer from my Iron Maiden tanker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm floating the corner right now. <laughs> Listen, Tim, is it Nick or Tate Total now? Nick, yeah, I think he might be. Aye. There you go. I think it'll be acceptable then if it's good enough for Nick. Mm-hmm. He's also a Christian, so... He is. Oh, we're back to that again. Yeah, really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't take long, did it? I ripped it. That's it, that last week. It wasn't even Easter or Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so, on to business. Uh, let's first let's let's do news. What's happened in the world since we last spoke? Fuck off. <laughs> in, in, in the in the musicy world, we'll stick there. <clears throat> well, the, the Eddie Van Halen story, Richie was Richie brought up. I did some research on that, and that's a cracker. That mm. was a revelation. Him and Fred Durst. What happened there? So ba- the story goes, um, I think it's from an un- unofficial biography, but I think it's true. There, for some, some somehow or another, Ed ended up backstage with Limp Biscuit at the time when Wes Borland had left the band, and the, through banter, it was brought up that Ed should have a jam, and they had a bit of a laugh, and then Ed went, "No, no, let's do it." So they had a bit of a jam, whatever, shot the shit, Ed left, and. Then, Apparently, he'd left all his gear with Frederick, who had not been forthcoming and returning it, shall we? Mm. So Ed oh. rocked up in a pickup truck with a, a gun thing, like turret, apparently, <laughs> on the back, which is not legal. It was an armoured vehicle. He rocked up in an armoured vehicle to Fred's house with uh, boots that were gaffer taped together, trousers tied together with drawstring. Bag in his mouth and a gun in his hand and demanded that he get his shit back immediately. <laughs> Fred, Fred very quickly went and got said equipment. <coughs> That's rightful owner. Awesome. Apparently what set him off was when he turned up at the jam, he could smell ganja. That's right. And yeah. apparently the That's smell right. of ganja sets him off. <laughs> I can name somebody who absolutely loves Eddie Van Halen. And said subject, so <laughs> maybe you shouldn't meet, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Never but meet. I'm not going to name who that person is. <laughs> Bless her, mate. Does, does, does his name rhyme with Brew Bondy? <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly. Brew Bondy. <laughs> Brew Bondy. <laughs> I remember um, the when the, the story kind of did the first rounds that Ed was jamming with with Limp Biscuit. I, I do remember that happening. Yeah. Well, well. <laughs> <laughs> that was. When was that? When did you hear that? Um, I can't remember. The only thing I remember about the particular time was that um, Ed had developed a a tremolo. That he had on a like a prototype guitar, and it was like mm-hmm. a drop tuning trem thing. So it was like a bridge that the whole thing shifted and did like a full. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. Trans trem. Kind of. It was based on the trans trem, but it was like a brass thing. And I remember at the time thinking, I wonder if that will come out, and it never did. And I've never seen it again. So yeah. fuck, fuck knows what happened to that. 
Maybe it's still got it in your garage, you never brought it back. <laughs> Fred, that's uh, Fred that's garage. <laughs> I mean, if, if that took place around 2003, like it was suggested in that article, which uh, Stu found it, wasn't it? You found it. Yeah. Um, 2003, I was, I was fairly switched off from music around then, so I wouldn't have uh, heard anything about Eddie Van Halen wasting his time with Limp Biscuit. It was... I've made it clear. I mean, this is my own personal opinion here. I think the worst thing of that is that Eddie Van Halen didn't pull the trigger. <laughs> But well, then again, Limp Bizkit's popularity had already peaked by that point, so what difference would it make? <laughs> that that was the year before they did the ill-fated Sammy Hagar reunion that ended in... Actually. <laughs> Is that the moment they did Dave and Sammy? No. That was, that, that was the Dave and Sam tour, but there was no Van Halens involved in that. Did that ever go ahead? Because oh, I remember reading about it in one of the magazines. What, the Sam and Dave tour? Yeah, but it was the, Van No, no, the, the two Van Halen were two front men. No, that's never happened. Yeah, it did. Right. No, it didn't. Yeah, it did. I know the two of them toured together, but I didn't know if they toured <laughs> together with Van Halen. Yeah. And it was talked about for quite some time. Or it was going to happen. It was talked about. It never happened. But uh, Sam, and, Sam and Dave did their own tour with their own bands. That must be what I'm thinking of then. Yeah. Yeah. That in itself is its own story. Yeah. <laughs> Sam likes to bring the life to the party. I am the party. <laughs> oh, the, the, the Howard Stern yeah. clips were brilliant when they had Dave on and they phoned up Sammy. That was that was comedy gold. Dave's always good. Yeah. Dave, Dave, Dave on the Joe Rogan podcast was gold. Oh, they're they're brilliant. I could watch them endlessly. It's just he's he's as mad as a box of frogs. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's it's jazz podcasting is what that is. <laughs> complete babbling nonsense. And yet completely engaging. You can't not watch the man when he's talking. Yeah. It only, only makes sense to Dave. <laughs> a Dave TV. I think that's a subject for a future podcast, Van Halen. <laughs> Oh, there's plenty of material there. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, that, um, Stu, did you watch that cover version that I sent the other night? Um, Van Halen doing... Oh, the who? The who? Before the game. Aye, that was an outstanding version, man. I thought that was awesome. Yeah, that was always a good in that. They did, they did it in concert a few times. That scream, Sammy gave it the end, man. Fucking <laughs> outstanding. Didn't they get that? You couldn't even do that anymore. <laughs> Sammy couldn't do it anymore. He's <laughs> <laughs> what, 73 now or something, isn't he? I mean, he's kept his pipes a long, long, long time. Oh, God, I, I has. How's that? Mm-hmm. There yeah. Ain't, there ain't many. No. And, but no. Like that. Time catches up with everybody eventually. Even Dio was starting to to have his band detuned towards his final days. Yeah. You know, people say Dio kept it up until the end. He was starting to go a little. Yeah, I mean, you can you can hear it's a little shakier as they get older. If you're lucky like Dio, you can just get extra character. Yeah, I mean, that's it's the adapter. Yeah. Yeah, Snyder, he's still kicking on. He's still going strong. He's best. Fuck. He's also... Uh, He's not hugely busy either, <laughs> you know, the singing. <laughs> that's a factor as well, man. That was, that, that'll, I'll talk about that later with my comeback album, actually. But that is a factor on these guys. They're hand it for years. It's, you're not going to keep the pipes if you've been yeah. 30 years straight every night. I remember having a, a talk with somebody once about Glenn Hughes and how like how Glenn sounds so good now. And I was kind of like, well, he did take like 20 years out, <laughs> but yeah. he didn't, didn't sing at all, you know? Yeah. Aye, but what did you do with those 20 years, though? <laughs> allegedly. Actually, it's not even allegedly. glenn has been quite honest about it, to be fair. Well documented. <laughs> I mean, he's even said he doesn't even remember the 1980s. Mm. It's yeah, because he recorded <laughs> on one of Black Sabbath's best albums. <laughs> to be fair, I don't remember much of the 80s either. That's, that Sabbath album with Glenn in it is amazing. It is. 
there was Hughes Thrall at that time as well, which is also really good. Speaking of Sabbath, it's Heaven and Hell's birthday today. Is it? Happy birthday. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. To Ronnie. Yeah. Happy birthday, Ronnie. And the rest of the boys in Black Sabbath, if they're watching. Missing from my collection, that. I mean, I've got more rules, but I haven't got that one. And I used to have to humanise her. Heaven, Heaven and Hell is the best album either by Ronnie, in my opinion. I prefer it over Mob Rules and the Human Laser. Their best full stop. Yeah. Oh, I really liked the Heaven and Hell album, though. Yeah. Mm. Band yeah, Heaven and Hell. Bible Black, etc. Yeah. yeah. What was the album called? The Devil You Know? Devil You Know. Devil you know? Yeah. Oh, Great record. Although I have to say, some of the lyrics in the song, The Bible Black, were pretty fucking ropey. It's heavy metal, of course they were. Yeah. Who are you and who are me? Who are me? <laughs> we're, we're, we're in no a lot of time about lyrics, by the way, guys. Like we're on shaky ground here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pot we'll shit or kettle. We'll we love Ronnie. Oh, na na na. Well, if you can't take a piss out of yourselves, then who can you take the piss out of, you know? To be fair, I wrote that on uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh City Bypass on the way in. It worked. I, well, I can remember you sent it to me. Aye. You singing it. I was on the shitter at work. <laughs> Just yourself laughing. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, no, see, that's why, I, that's why I don't write anymore. <laughs> What what else has happened in music this week? Uh, Mickey Crystal. Mickey's left the Tigers. Mm-hmm. He's left the Tigers. That was a that was a bit of a bombshell. I bet they blew that, wasn't it? Uh, I think. Do you think? I think we're going to see a bit. I've seen a few bands have announced that quits this week as well. Uh, wow. You know, so I think I think this is going to split a few. I mean, there's no really being a band at the minute, is there? And there's no no end date for when we start being a band. And so I guess there's a lot of guys maybe thinking, what's the point? Yeah. But then what's the point of not? Because you're just sat your <laughs> Split us. So, yeah. But I was just, after having, I, I've got to be honest, I haven't heard the last Tigers album. But the first one Mickey did with them was... Gold, man. Yeah, it's a great album. Absolute gold. I have one off, one track off the new album, and I was disappointed, to be honest. The the, the first one, the, the one that Mickey was on was a banger. Oh, it was. You know, that was a that was a top. Oh, I, I still play that to this day. I played the shit out of that when it came out. Mm-hmm. It was great. <clears throat> and you can hear Mickey all over it. That kind of John Sykes influence is big throughout that record. It's very sexy. Oh, yeah, definitely with the rest. <laughs> so, uh, What's wrong with being sexy? Nothing. That's all. I see what you did. Mm. That was quick, Richard. <laughs> that was you good. Know, you've not enough drinks yet, clearly, to be that quick. Nigel Tough and all of the On that subject, Mickey Crystal, um, I think it was. Late 2012, I went back home to Newcastle to see my mate's band. And um, they got, I was either 2012 or 2013, they got a guest guitarist up out of the audience. And he played one number with them. And uh, the singer guitar player, my mate Russ, says, Ladies and gentlemen, Mickey Crystal, who's just about to go into stardom and fame by joining the Tigers of Pantang. <laughs> and uh, I didn't even know that until I'd seen my mate had announced it at that gig. He really kind of gave them a lift. Aye. Who is on? Who is? I don't even know who was playing with them before Mickey. Um. Be the man to know that. They had a bunch of guys, didn't they? It was just like a revolving door. Yeah. I didn't see him with any bands back in Newcastle. Um. <laughs> I don't remember seeing him on the club scene or anything like that. No, I'm saying like he, he, he was. He was doing a lot of um, guest guest spots with a blues band called the Bone Shakers. He was doing a lot of guest spots with them. And they're really making a name for himself. 
we want to see where the Tigers will go next. Hmm. In terms of who they're going to get on board. Yeah. Because they kind of need that shreddy guy. Yeah. To be a particular kind of guy now to, to play those songs. I mean, did Mickey bring his own sound in or was that? Yeah. Yeah, he did, but it harked back to the Sykes era. Yeah. You could you could hear the influence, but it was undeniably Mickey. So they need it's it's a kind of very John Sykes here. There's Zach Wildy bits in there. It's, you need a pro, it needs a proper shredder to be in that band now. Yeah, Big Nick Jennison. Big Nick Jennison's doing nothing at the minute. Ah, yes, he's John Blitzkrieg. Nick playing for Blitzkrieg. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That would, be, that would have been the obvious choice. <laughs> but Blitzkrieg beat them yeah, to it. You know, it he's like stuck on the Glenn's former place. Yeah. So that would have been an obvious one, but uh, he's taken. Ah, yeah, that's the kind of guy they need. So, yeah. Interesting, but a, a, a strange one for him to, to leave at that time. Kind of, the Tigers are doing really well, kind of playing yeah. all over Europe. And he, yeah, can't really speculate because we don't know the guy, but. Uh-huh. Uh, it's always a shame, though, you know. When, when the, some... one who, the one who's respected um, guitar player from the northeast um, with the, the chops. Um, the one that springs to my mind, you lads might not know who he is, a lad called Phil Martin, who's been quite a staple on the club scene for the last few decades. He's a hell of a guitar player and uh, he's quite well known as well in the locality. But think, we can only speculate. I think they need to get another younger, younger kind of guy in, though. Yeah, you need, like, Mickey brought that energy to the to the band as well. You need the hot young guitar singer. That's yeah. what you're gonna have to. That's kind of what they're. they're that's become their thing since. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they can't equal doing that route. <clears throat> so yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. And that's news. <laughs> news. <laughs> worth, <laughs> there's not a lot of news worth going on. Any other news stories? I mean, that's it. It's it's slim pickings now. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's kind of it, isn't it, really? <laughs> let's go. Let's go with the Bob with the weather. <laughs> <laughs> it's cloudy. Is there a windsurfing squirrel anywhere to be seen? No. <laughs> Has that happened in the morning? Don't drink bleach, by the way. Don't drink bleach. Beer, whiskey, all those things are fine. Do not drink bleach. Yeah. Don't drink toilet duck. It's oh. a big no-no. Yeah. Maybe we could, we could try, try a light. Try, try a big, strong light. <laughs> and avoid the solid bang. That stuff's lethal. <laughs> that That's this week's meme, in it? You know? It really is, yeah. It's memed out. <laughs> the thing is, it's nothing new. It was a few weeks ago somebody brought something to my attention saying that you can't somebody had tried that in the United States with yeah, ingested cleaning fluid and no surprise, then he died. <laughs> then he died. Oh, we have, we've been drinking Ajax in the tooth for years. <laughs> Ajax. <laughs> Ajax in court, please, bud. <laughs> Dispatch cleaning fluid Ajax to cleanse my body. <laughs> Right, shall we move on to the meat of today's show? Okay, right. Yeah. Today's topic is going to be... Topics. Okay, but I'm just going to pick the first one. <laughs> Sorry. Let's do it in some kind of order here. So topic one is going to be picking your favourite or an influential non-metal album. Just to show that we're of, of eclectic taste. We're well-rounded. We are. Some of us are more well-rounded than others. We, we are not death to all but metal. We are inclusive of everything. We're death to all but metal, but not all but metal. All but metal, yeah. <laughs> so define but metal. You know, cunt. Oh, God, I think, yeah, I think you may have to cut that out. So I don't, well, that's a legit band name, isn't it? It's a legit band name. I just used a profanity. Yeah, it's a legit band. Billy looks like he's Mine is blown. That's a legit band. Yeah. <laughs> Grindcore, isn't it? Is it Grindcore? I oh, see. Just yeah, one of the mates had some of that stuff years ago. Fucking core. Yeah. And, and the core in it, it's fucking drink a bleach. 
into the sea. <laughs> oh, I only drink, I only like apple core. <laughs> <laughs> Math core. What the hell's that about? Math core doesn't sound good, does it? Most anything core. Oh, double period of math core. <laughs> I don't understand. Go first. Uh, right, well, we'll start. Um, I'll just do the round the clock thing again, which I discovered in last week's episode translates in no way as to what you can see on the screen now because everybody changes. But we're going to pick somewhere, so I'm going to start in that direction, and that's Richie. So you're up. Okay. Um, right. I might be cheating you because this is a compilation. Oh, However, I'll be established. Um, <laughs> We never established rules, so we'll let him away with it. Unless it's shit, in which case you're going to be forced quickly to pick something else. Can we do soundtracks in this? As long as it's not it's the for Batman, because that would be Boston's pick. You <laughs> 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 um, Right. My first love as a stringed instrument was not a guitar, not a bass. It was a bazooki. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Irish one though. The Greek one. <coughs> <coughs> and I have many an enjoyable occasion listening to this album on vinyl cassette with my granddad. <laughs> 14 original Sataki. <laughs> Laugh all these ones. This is a compilation of traditional Greek music. Look at the cup. I'm doing them away to get some plates. Oh, God, yeah. Is that yeah, not, yeah. Is, is that not the fizz? <laughs> no. No, no. This is all legit. I, I never get tired of this record. I absolutely love it. It looks like three Biffa Bacons. Jordan, they're not. As I said there, um, my granddad owned that on vinyl and cassette. We used to listen to the cassette in the car and the vinyl in the house, and I never got tired of it. It's probably because, you know, I heard so many of the songs from it when we had holders in Greece when I was a kid, um, in the Greek islands and that. Um, and yes, it does have Zova's dance on it, which everybody knows. <coughs> I just love it, you know, traditional Greek songs. Um, some have got lyrics, some haven't. Obviously, it's in Greek, so I don't understand it. Um <laughs> But the melodies, the melodies that the bazooki creates on this are fantastic, you know. I think there's a, I think this that album could be more of an influence than some people reckon. You know, when you listen to guitar players are more of an exotic flavour, and they're probably trying to incorporate the the style of what you would write on a bazooki into electric guitar playing. We're we talking about Malmsteen. Well, that's an obvious reference. Um, I know uh, there's a guy's name from Rhapsody. Look at Torelli on one of his solo albums. He tried to do it, and he did it quite effectively. You know, it was quite a bazooki-style melody on one of the tunes. It was uh, quite enjoyable. You aren't impressed at all, are you? <laughs> I'll be no. honest. It's not something I've, I've spent a lot of time listening to. No. <laughs> it's not what I expected to hear from you, Richie. Well, you know, you did say earlier, you know, we're not all about heavy metal and whatnot, and uh, I do the I do enjoy the old traditional Greek tune. This is true. Yeah. I mean, at least it's I not. Like you meant Firewind. Ghost <laughs> <laughs> <Gosh>, gee! <laughs> Oi, leave my mate alone. I'm just glad it's not a Jimmy Shand album. Oh no! <laughs> well, no, I haven't got any of that. <laughs> no. I'll wait for a Jimmy Shan. <laughs> hey. Die hard. I can't really contribute anything to this conversation at this point because I have no feelings or opinions on bazookies. I thought there were things you put over your shoulder and shot at tanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny enough, when I was a kid, I used to think a bazooka was a musical instrument. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> no, you I, that's my, that's my two pennies worth, lads. Honestly, um, I never, I never get tired of that record. And uh, now and again on a day off, me and my mates who's um, always having holders in Greece, we'll have a, a day around the days and I'll take that record round and we'll play it while having a drink. 
I hope, you, I hope you get up and have a dance. Why? Well, <laughs> that's about that's about that's about seven or eight pints later. Like you got to do the old sataki, you know? A, is that a Greek folk dance, by <laughs> Great. Right. Not a medieval one, a Greek one. <laughs> can you can you give us a quick? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, here you go. Is that good enough for you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> oh, that bombshell. A lot of hope for conversation here. Glad, glad we didn't finish that one. <laughs> you, got any, you got any others? Something that we can actually talk about? <laughs> well then. You'll probably slag us for this one and I'll. Is that Linda's phone? This is the crankiest first album, you know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going deeper into the Oxfam bargain bin here. <laughs> this is some fish. This is, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Richie's 50p finds. Yep. Well, admittedly, admittedly, I owned this album years ago on CD as well. Um, You want pop music? Level 42. I am a bass player. Okay, I can't talk about that. Stu, you probably can. That's musical, musical music, that is. <laughs> oh, no, I can appreciate no, my the more poppy albums. It wasn't when they were like a fusion jazz outfit in their early stuff. But um, obviously the one thing that re- remains consistent through the career is the incredible bass work on their records. Plus you can sing and play that stuff as well, which is alien. Is that the, is that the Lessons in Love album? When I run in the family, yes. That's the, that's the first track of it, aye. Lessons in Love. It's good. I enjoy. I can. I can listen to that. Yeah, the, the, the early, the early stuffs, um, but like experiments and time changes and uh, had more of a jazz influence, even though they're officially classed as Brit funk. <laughs> that was one um, of the, one of the yeah. themes with pop music, particularly around that time, was that there was a lot of jazz guys that were coming through and playing, uh, which is going to play well into my album pick. <laughs> That was back when pop music was actually music, and it actually had yes. musicians, yes. and yeah, they yeah. actually had bands and songwriters. Yeah. Yes, can definitely. Can you name all the members of Level 42? That fucking can. Uh, From the top of my head. Um, Mark King. Mark yeah. King. Yeah. Wang King. Mark <laughs> <Bob> King. <laughs> Bill Gold, Boone Gold, um, Mike Laudrup. Oh, what's his name? Alan Murphy. West. Yeah, there was a few a few members came and went as well. Alan Holdsworth played on one album at all. Mm. Mm. Just one album? I thought he did more. No, no, he played on Guaranteed because um, Alan Murphy passed away, so they got Alan Holdsworth in to take his place for a bit. Yeah. I do know the guy from King Crimson just now who used to play in Level 42. I don't know his name. That's, that, that's a conversation stopper. Sorry. Mark King couldn't play without the wee dots, though. <laughs> I, I use wee dots on mine, too. I've got numbers on me. And arrows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, let's move on. Who's next? Uh, next is me. Ooh. Which is kind of interesting because I'm going to follow on Richie <laughs> and I'm going to pick... One of my favourite albums, which is not metal, is Go West by Go West. Yes. Good memories of that album. Yeah. Hey, summer that year. It was. We were allowed out of the house. <laughs> in a van to listen to it. We, we played the hell out of that when we were driving across Newcastle. Uh, yeah. yeah. It was from um, when we were playing in Haywood, we in Newcastle. That's right, yeah. So... Newcastle. I mean, what can you say about this album? Every song in it was pretty much like a, a hip pop song. Um, if you don't like We Close Our Eyes, You Have No Soul, <clears throat> that, that's just a perfect pop song. That's good. Writing doesn't get much better than that. It was that, that great time in music where keyboards still sounded like keyboards. <laughs> they were like just at the dying end of analog coming in yeah. so they had they had the warmth of analog but they were 
you know, you were getting into digital territory, so you, there was like you could do things with them, mm-hmm. just and stuff. It was very clever because it was so suitable for commercial US radio. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. At the time, you know, very, very clever. And Britain was still kind of exporting pop acts to the rest of the world, you know. Yeah. Good pop acts. Yeah, and they have the exceptional Alan Murphy on lead guitar. And Alan Murphy, if I mean, everybody's heard Alan Murphy play because he's played on like a million songs that everybody's heard. <laughs> I couldn't even list. So, I mean, he played with everybody, you know, Kate Bush and Level 42 and Mike and the Mechanics and all these people who were like hugely popular at the time, all those jazz legato solos that you hear that are just face melting that was alan outstanding guy if you can ever in fact it's easy to find if you go on youtube and look up go west live on the tube yeah i have them that's great and watch alan ripping the solos on those songs live with the band outstanding i mean i could i could watch that all day yeah such a tasteful player for a jazz guy. He had like super melody. Fitted the songs. Yeah. And he's, the sound was massive. Mm-hmm. But I mean, fundamentally, they're just great songs. They're like, they're good, catchy sing along songs. Well produced. Great band. Yeah, go west, we're kicking. Yeah. Yep. Good choice. Good choice. Totally back that one. 100% back that more than Greek folk music. No offence, Greece. I love the Greece. All right. The people probably, and the place. I used to I used to live around the corner from where they uh, used to film the tube. And uh, I used to drink with a lot of lads who were a bit older than me. So I probably knew a few lads who saw them. Mm. I know some lads who were quite regular and getting into audiences uh, for the tube. I know one lad who saw Thin Lizzy when they'd done that. So the tube is a great show, man. The tube is great. Yeah, we don't have like a proper music show. Nah. The closest you've got is Joe Collins. Of course, well, I mean, it's the tube of this band, Caught in the Act. Great well, singing album. Right about the same time as the tube, you had uh, the one on Channel Four as well. It was ECT, ETC. Remember that one? Uh, extra celestial transmission or some fucking thing. And uh, the bands, all oh, the bands that they were on it. Um, Fucking heavy petting uh, spider, spider were on it. Oh right, yeah. No uh, one. Hi, Warlock were on it. Fucking like that. Phil Lennon, Gary Moore were on it. And that was it was a, a breath of fresh air for your discerning metal fan of the day. <laughs> it, was, it was something new, you know. I'd never seen before. I'd a complete half hour or forty odd minutes dedicated to heavy metal. Yeah. Sounds good, that way. Like. Uh, does Jules Holland still do his show? Uh, it's even worse than it used to be, though, man. It's uh, fucking terrible. That's kind of where I was going to go with that. Like, I mean, it, they just stopped having a good variety of acts on these programmes. It became. It's, it's all like African nose flute uh, music on it now, with him fucking vamping some honky tonk piano over the top of it. Like, fuck what old Jules? Music. It became super kind of anal about... <coughs> Me form squeeze. The, the great thing about shows like The Tube and stuff was that it, you, there was like all kinds of stuff in it. Mm-hmm. Those kind of shows, like The Word as well. You know, The Word, was, that was your own, yeah. There was just like, you'd have like mm-hmm. a punk act and then like some kind of pop act and then like a metal band and then, you know, just all kinds of different shit. And the last I, thing I can think of that you had that was like that was TGI Friday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, TFI Friday. TFI yeah, Friday. it's the best TFI. one. TFI Friday. Um, oh, which, they even had Neopon Death on that once. Yeah, and like Terrorvision, I'm sure, were on it at one point. Death no more. Metallica. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was the last kind of show of its type. Uh-huh. There was just a, there was more of a mixing of styles and things you could you could put things together, and it wasn't frowned upon. The thing is, there's, there's no need there's no need for that anymore though, because all that shit exists on. YouTube, Netflix, <laughs> whatever. There's no need for a TV these, show anymore. Uh, these things were a lawyer's nightmare because there was always drink involved with yeah. the guests. You know what I mean? So uh, the, the Sean Ryder story is legendary. Yeah. 
<laughs> an editor's dream. Not. <laughs> not alcohol, kid. <laughs> it is kind of interesting, though, because, I mean, like, the whole kind of, I suppose, even the reason we're talking about this is because... It, I don't know if it's pretty much, you know, just prevalent in, in the metal world. I suppose it's not. It's probably in everything. But it's we've become so fixated on genres these days where, like, I mean, like, liking stuff like Go West is one of the main reasons I have never been fully accepted into the Metalhead Club, you know? The thing is, it's, a lot of it's to do with, like, if you go back to the, like, the 80s, there was niche marketing started coming out and people were just targeting and yeah. then everything just became a genre. Even heavy, me- heavy metal as a genre has probably about 50 or 60 genres within it. Yeah. Like yeah. within the genre of heavy metal, there's hundreds. Um, and yeah, like you said, there's, there used to be just good music and bad music. Yeah. There was two types of music, that was it. Shit and good. Post shit core. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I would struggle to name different genres. I, I, it means so little to me. I, I've I either like it or I don't. Mm. I can give you a rough idea, like if it's metal-ish or punk-ish or you know something. But that specific genre stuff, when you get into the cores, the <coughs> well, what you what you usually find with that is that there'll be one great band that came out, and then about fifteen different bands copied them, and then it became a genre at that point. Yeah, that's an issue. <coughs> and that's when you you can't say like, oh, I like death metal. Because there's probably a million shitty death metal bands, <laughs> and there's probably well, like is. maybe there's maybe like ten really really good ones, and yeah. but like millions upon millions of really shit ones, and you can apply that to any genre as well. So you can't just say I'm a fan of uh, yeah. whatever. Yeah. You have to be a bit more discerning than that, I think. I mean, just like looking at the playlist of this week, it's been all kinds of stuff I've done. Um, what have we played? I've played some Go West. I've played Hallas. Uh, Richie Cotson. Uh, Kiss. <laughs> Van Halen. There's been, a, I mean, like all kinds of weird and wonderful things. Uh, some fusion stuff. And I had, a, if I had, an, I had an Alan Holdsworth album on at one point this week. Mad. It's like a bit Holdsworth like. Yeah, but I mean. It, the thing that I think that they all have in common is musicianship, no matter what um, genre they were in. It was people who were dedicated to doing the best they could with whatever they had. Mm-hmm. I think, like, as, as a musician as well, you have to kind of listen to different stuff because otherwise your shit's just going to always sound the same. Yeah. If you only listen to Iron Maiden, then your shit's going to sound like Iron Maiden. Aye. <clears throat> You need to get a bit of outside influence from other kinds of music. This is like... We all like the, we all like the TV show I've eaten same pet. Yeah. Um, but that's back to Go West for a minute because that's seen in the uh, nightclub where Oz picks a fight with a cop at Go West in the background. <laughs> I mean, eighties pop was the. I mean, pop music up until the, I suppose maybe the early nineties. I don't know really. I kind of probably checked out a bit then, but. Up to then, pop music was great, and from then on, shit. <laughs> like, I can't think of a good pop band. But it started going dancey. I mean, even then, like, the early dance bands were at least doing something was, of interest. They were yeah. doing, they were pushing boundaries and trying to do something new. It was it at started, least original at the time. Yeah. It started going processed, in my opinion. I think, I think the rough set in... I know we'll briefly mention him on the last podcast. I think the, the rock setting really with that stock air Kim Waterman era. So you listen to a lot of those yeah, tunes, it doesn't matter who the artist is, and they're all similar. And you got to that in the same. 1990s. And you had bands that, well, musical acts, that just sounded all the same with a slightly different melody over the top. Yeah, totally. Christ. Pop music yeah. it went stacked. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's always been there. Even from like bubblegum pop of the sixties and seventies and stuff, that yeah, stuff that always, out. always been there. It's just well, occasionally saying that there is one stock Aitken and Waterman production that is a fucking banger and it's been covered so many times. It's Rick Astley. 
No. <laughs> I don't want to say that. Dead is a lie. You spin me round. Mm. Which is a tune. Yeah. As is Rick Astley. And then so is Rick Astley, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he knows the rules, and so do I. So we've kind of we've kind of hugged with ourselves on that point. Yeah. <laughs> Scotland for just going Paul. I don't even know who that is. My favourite waste of time. Oh really? Oh, well, yeah, know the song, don't know the guy. Like the Bishop. <laughs> Oh man, the coffin's like contagious today. It's almost like there's a virus going around. You think so? Uh, <laughs> showing the symptoms. No. The symptoms. <laughs> a fever today. Mm. A fever's like really bad tonight, which is shit, you know. We'll do the following forecast in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, where anyway, where was it? Go west. Go west. Oh, yeah. Good pack. Good pack. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't even know if there's much more I can say about it. Tracks, killer. We close our eyes, great song. Don't, don't look down, great song. Call me, great song. Aye, aye, great song. Haunted, SOS, Goodbye Girl, Innocence, and Missing Persons. Every one of those a banger. If you do not know Go West, give your ears a treat and go and listen to it, because it's fucking amazing. Call me as a fucking stoker. Right, I'm going to listen to it after this podcast. Yeah. Everybody's going to have a bit of go best tonight. I think I'll give this one later, I? Great <laughs> But watch the tube thing as well, because that's really good. And you get to see Alan, who sadly departed the land of the living uh, not too long after. I think it was about 1990 or something he died, wasn't it, thereabout? Yeah, yeah early 90s, I think you told me one thing. Yeah, oh, thereabouts. The thing as well, with these 80s bands, like pop bands, when you watch them live, they're like rock bands. Yeah. Because they have proper, like a, a full band. They had a band, yeah. And you, it's like, they're great life. You couldn't say that about any fucking pop band now. <laughs> Jamiroquai is still that. Jamiroquai can fuck off. Shut up, Billy, talking hey. shit. You're drunk. <laughs> Jamiroquai are like... I might have been a Jamiroquai person they like. I thought they were all right. Nah, yeah. stupid hat. Fuck them. I mean, Jamiroquai was like 30 years ago now. What? Funny. Shut up, was it? 25. Oh, that's depressing. 90s? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, right. mid 90s. Return the Space Cowboy and stuff like that. <laughs> Throwing about 1995 ish. I was in high school when Jamaica and I were kind of kicking out, so. Yeah, me too. In time, me too. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. Right, we'll, we'll move along now to uh, Steve. You're up next. Is it me, love? Right. <laughs> I've not gone retro. Well, I suppose I have kind of gone retro, modern retro. Um, so, when I'm not listening to metal, I do listen to quite a lot of stuff. And there's probably loads of stuff I could have picked. And if we had compilations, I probably would have picked a couple of great sets, but I didn't realise that was on the go. Um, so, I picked a synthwave artist called Time Cop 83. So, right. if you're not familiar with what synthwave is, it's, it's electronic music. If you like Stranger Things, it's like the soundtrack for Stranger Things. But you've got, there's like dark ambient synthwave, kind of like cyberpunky synthwave, and there's a kind of more dreamy 80s drive a Ferrari down Miami Beach. Like, the, I am, like the I Am Eagle soundtrack. No, that's more like your... Oh no, yeah, it's more, yeah, it's kind of along that, that kind of lines. And um, that's more computer gamey. 80s computer gaming. That's right. a different thing. They had the Rocky Fogler. Yes. Yeah. Vince like Cola. Exact. Yes. Vince exactly that. If you like the Grand Theft Auto Vice City soundtrack, you're gonna like Time Cop 83. Now the album. Sorry, I didn't tell you what the album was. The album was. Let me find the name. I just listened to it today, actually. Um, it's also got a couple of really good guest spots. If you're familiar with a UK kind of synthwave slash rock rock band called Le Brock. Uh, who are a really good band. The singer's incredible, guitar player's incredible. They're on this album too. Uh, the album is called... Incidentally, they've got a ref- an album called Reflections, which if you're still a game fan, that'll be relevant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ah, nah. Night Drive, is it? Is it that one? Reflections, we're going to get mad with you. Thank you. Very, um, yeah. 
keep going, lads. I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to get some beer. Sorry, I'm looking. I've, I've fucked up here. I should have had this to hand. He's away for a big pool. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, a nice relaxing one. A nice relaxing pool. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I fucked up here. All right, you're doing fine. I can't find the name of the album. Always, actually, I always, find, for some reason, find it hard to find. Uh, I'm on band. It's on Bandcamp, by the way. Incidentally, you should go into Bandcamp and you should uh, buy stuff from Bandcamp because bands get paid. Watch the look up for them on Bandcamp. Just type in Time Copy 80, 90, Time Copy 83 and just listen to anything that they do. Uh, can Can you see that? Is that no? All blurry. Yeah. No. Fuck it. I'll go. back to Puddle of Mud again. Right? Everything's Everything so blurry. Yeah. That. I can't remember the name of the album. My research is rubbish. I've had, I've had that one beer. I'm fucked. <laughs> but go and go and Google uh, Bandcamp, Time Cop eighty three. Um, just listen to all of it because it's all really, really, really fucking good. It is really good. Um, really just definitely got that Vince DiCola kind of sound. Dreamy uh, analog synths. If you like. Uh, and Richie will kill me because he's not here for this bit and he would really like to join in this conversation but it's very in the kind of vein of the Transformers 1986 oh soundtrack. yes yes you know Stan, exactly Bush, that. Stan Bush you've got yeah. the you've got the power all oh, that yeah like, it's like that amazing it, it's probably slightly less rocky than that but there are there are yeah. guitars in it um, but Synthwave does that there's you know kind of go through and it's all electric but then eventually you'll, you'll just find something where the, it just melds the synths with pure 80s go west guitar playing yeah. and it's fucking perfect it's really it's chilled music it's music i'd listen to like at night before i go to sleep um or if you're going on a long drive it's actually perfect for driving the car to as well so yeah when i'm not listening to metal usually i'll go i'll go to synth wave but i could also, i probably could have said like the smiths or the cure uh, or the police. Mm. Again, those kind of eighties, not quite pop, but they are pop. But like kind of goth, goth, pop. yeah, gothy indie pop. Not the police, though. Police were kind of reggae, poppy, yeah. funky. Neither, neither were the Smiths, really. I gotta be honest. Yeah, the, but I think again, you just had to generalise it as pop because yeah. there were so many things it could have been. It was they were pop bands. Just that thing we just don't get anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The kind of like bands. I suppose it kind of kicked that kind of stuff off. Would have been like in the in the, the kind of mid seventies and things where you would get bands like Talking Heads, who were like pop bands, you know. Yeah, Blondie. Into the arty kind of world and. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Good shit. Are we still talking yeah. about electronic music? We were, and we just discussed Transformers soundtrack, and you missed it. Oh man, that's a belter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just saying it's, it's very much in the vein of the Transformers um, tech sound. Are you yeah. with me? Right. That extreme close up. <laughs> it's a bit creepy. Hold on. Got camera problems. There we go. Sorted. Jesus God, <laughs> it's a fucking, it's a moon, it's a full moon. <laughs> it's funny, before we before began the podcast, I mean, talking about, you know, electronic, electronically generated music, etc. Before we began the podcast, I was listening to Van Gillis. Oh, yeah. Well, similar kind of vibe then. Yeah. Yeah, similar it, kind of vibe, Time Cop. Got. That's like angly, like it makes you think you're watching Blade Runner. Yes. Well, yeah. it was the Blade Runner soundtrack I had on. <laughs> you can't argue with that closing theme. It's fantastic. No, it's, it was great. <laughs> there's, there's a heavy Blade Runner influence throughout the whole synthwave kind of genre. There's lots of that going through it. And like Terminator kind of vibes. There's a lot of synthwave records that are just, there's like a, you're going to band camp and there's a whole story. Are reams of story and the music's just a kind of accompaniment to this kind of futuristic dystopian story. It's really interesting. But as a genre, it's, it's doing, it seems to me to be more forward thinking than, like, like the metal as a genre, you learn a lot from it in terms of the artwork, 
yeah. the way they the way they merchandise or stuff. Uh, they do mini discs too. You'll be pleased to hear mini discs are making a comeback in synthwave. Um, yeah. Mini discs. Mini discs, man. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. The problem though is everything has been got too niche, so there, nobody's they're never shifting enough numbers for it to make a full blown comeback. Funnily enough, there, there's and I don't ask me the name of the song because I, I couldn't. But whenever I take Lisa's car to work, I turn it on and the radio's on. Can I obviously turn the radio off straight away? But on fourth <laughs> one, uh, a, a song comes on and I don't know who it's by or what it is, but it sounds like a synthwave song. So it's making a when you hear that, you can hear it's making a slight inroad. Into the into popular culture, which is probably due to Stranger Things. Yeah, it's definitely it definitely had an influence. Mm-hmm. So that is my pick. But yeah, like I said, I could have picked the Smiths, the Cure, the Police, any album. But usually I'll just go to Greatest Hits, and I'm wanting this little break from metal. I'll go to Greatest Hits, one of those guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. That being said, if I'm with the kids in the car, I'm listening to non-metal stuff all the time. It's like the pop punk stuff I'm listening to with those guys. So. <laughs> I was I was spinning Regatta de Blanc yesterday. Great so, album. Yeah. 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 Uh, Andy Andy Summers as a guitar player is just I love his tone. That that whole band were amazing. I mean there, there was yeah. no no weak link in the police. Nah. And t- that big a sound from three guys. It's like Rush. Well I was literally just gonna say they were the Rush of pop music. <laughs> yeah. Or police or they were the Rush were the police of rock music, one of the two. Very very closely linked at the same time because Rush were kicking out stuff that sounded like the police yeah uh, you know like when you get to like mid 80s uh, early mid 80s Cameron Waves and Moving mm-hmm. Pictures and stuff had definitely kind of hints of the police totally signals I was never a fan of the police and then I came across those uh, YouTube live videos yeah so, and, and live I think that's it. Right. and I was like fuck they're so right. so good and for the neck beards, they're one of Cliff Burton's favourite bands too. So <laughs> I didn't know that. There you go. Well, so were REM. So REM can suck a fucking. With one hand he giveth, and one hand he taketh away. Again, I quite like REM their stuff. I quite like it. Yeah, Michael State makes me want to fucking kick babies. I, I can't believe there's anybody alive who doesn't enjoy shiny happy people. Uh, hi. Me. That is an amazing song. It's a horrible song. Uh, it's a shit. It's awful. I also had that last. End of the world's all right, I suppose. No, I thought we were actually no, it's no. I had the no. last B fifty twos on it as well, which automatically. All right. That's terrible. Everything they did was terrible. Ash. Terrible band. Terrible yes. human yeah. beings. Yeah. Shouldn't be allowed to exist <laughs> as a band. No. Next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, it just. Got me thinking there about the B-52s. Oh, there's, you keep doing that. There's another. Yeah. Oh, again, um, all-time favourite songs, Love Shack, has to be in there. That is a fucking great song. What the fuck are you smoking? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Jesus. Never tired of that. Yeah. <laughs> lockdown, lockdown has not been kind to my guitar-slinging compadre. <laughs> Fucking hell! <laughs> in the B fifty twos. Oh, no shame, some no shame. <laughs> Rob lobster. Yeah, hey, man. Hey, Bill, you're up. Yeah, let's, let's segue go. away from the B fifty twos. Let's oh. move, Bill. What you got for us? Neil Diamond, the jazz singer. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> Justify your shitty taste. That's just wonderful. I had. Uh, you want another one? Aye, please, because that's terrible. Okay, it's uh, Gustav Holst, the planet. There you are. Shout, shout. I'll give you that one, Billy, definitely. Now, am I right in saying that I watched a documentary about Black Sabbath and apparently Tony Iommi ripped the riff for the song Black Sabbath from, I think, that. From New York? Geezer Butler. Geezer Butler, sorry. I think the riff came from that. And also... metal. Diamond Head as well done it. Oh, Nam Evil. Yes. But so anyone that did try to. <laughs> so Slayer are in for it as well. And yeah, right. okay. So, <laughs> there we are. There's, yeah, there's my two. So Good choice. Who'd you like to go for first? How's with the Neil Diamond part? What you got? Yeah. Diamond? It's awesome. He's a great songwriter. 
også en sanger. Uh, I just all of the above. There's not a bad song on the jazz singer soundtrack, and it's a great movie. I've never never seen it. Oh man, watch it. Yeah. Richie, you've got the album. You've never seen the movie. <laughs> I've got the album because it was a bloody twenty pence charity shop job. <laughs> But um, just a cool comment on that, Billy. I mean, I'm not going to say I'm a Neil Diamond fan because I'm not, but I cannot argue with Love on the Rocks. I think that's a brilliant tune. But no ace. Yeah, that one I can handle. But <laughs> I prefer the admittedly, I've never, admittedly, I've never played that record, ever. I prefer the darkness to Love on the Rocks. Yeah. <laughs> well, Neil Diamond makes me think of a, a 1970s smoky tenement flat in the Gorbals. Uh, where I grew up, yeah, and it smells like <laughs> chip. It smells like chips. Right, my, my house. <laughs> <laughs> Neil Diamond just reminds me of bloody pissheads in any shitey pub in any fucking town singing been, "Sweet Caroline." Yeah, it's, it's been played at a New Year's party, and your your auntie Deborah's had far too much gin, <laughs> and she's kissing you inappropriately. Ah, <laughs> uh, Swanson territory now. Yes, we are very deep in it. It's yeah, chip pan music. It is. <laughs> when, when, when chip pans were still a thing. Yeah. Your formica ceiling has turned yellow. <laughs> it's, no, it's a great album. <laughs> it's an absolute bang in an album. As is any version of uh, Hold the Planet that you care to go and listen to because there are many. Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite an intellectual choice, Bill. I think that's quite intellectual. Aye, no, it's good. It's classical music's awesome. Yeah, if, if you say classical music, that makes you sound more intelligent, automatically. Yeah, it's so much good classical music. Classical music was the metal of its day. Well, yeah, apparently so. It's interesting. I've always thought it, it's kind of fun, right? When people complain about metal, one of the things they talk about is the guitar playing. And how, like, you know, it, I'm going into the kind of what the uninitiated will tell you is that, like, when the guitar player he's playing all those notes and stuff, and it's like he's just spaffing off. Why do you need to do that and shit? And it's like nobody ever told Beethoven that he put too many notes in one of his <laughs> pieces, you know? Paganini, Paganini is your prime example. No, and didn't they? I mean, they all died of syphilis, didn't they? They were all, <laughs> they were all absolute swordsmen of the highest order. That's not metal, I don't know what it is. <laughs> he was ripped into me earlier about the um the traditional Greek music LP. And but another one so that I used to, I, another one I used to listen to on vinyl on my granda when I was a Ben was Gustav Holst's Planet Suite. Yeah. Good choice. Yeah. I I love the entire suite. Well interestingly Holst himself actually hated it because mm. it took the attention away from his other compositions. Right. Did um did Deep Purple not rip it off on something as well? What's Probably. Planet? Black Hole Probably. ripped everything off. Yeah, Probably, it is. Yeah. Probably everybody's ripped it off at some point. Anything that sounds a bit kind of evil is probably probably goes back to there, isn't it? Really? <laughs> the the World of Union, the fucking rugby song. But then the whole Devil's Tritone is basically what heavy metal is invented on. Oh, which oh, is classical. Oh, which is classical. But well, classical music invented heavy metal. None yeah. of the blues shit. Get that the fuck. Yeah, like part of your arse. I guess. Yes. No, you're wrong. Here's next week's podcast: blues <laughs> versus classical. Who invented, who invented metal? Me- metal. And the both had stuff. Metal was when the blues met classical. Blues can suck. Oh. Hi, Lisa. You're on the telly. <laughs> it's the tantrum podcast. <laughs> no, Stu says classical met blues. That, it's that, a bit that, of both, as far as I'm concerned. You listen, yeah, yeah. listen to his, his first album, it's heavily blues. Heavily. Who, Sabbath's first album? Yeah. Yeah. Sure He's otherwise detained. Tell you later. I had another one as well. Um, I'm, I'm about your uh, Yanni tribute. Why do I recognise that? I feel like it's I know. But it's get Yanni. Aye. Uh, Greek look, getting back to the fucking bazooka. 
Yanni Gers. Yanni Gers. Yanni Gers. It looks great. <laughs> Um, but no, go and have a listen to Yanni's tribute. Um, it was... Is that tribute to Yanni or is it Yanni himself? No, oh, it's Yanni himself. Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, recorded at Taj Mahal. Okay. No, not the restaurant. It's down the fucking <laughs> history either. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get a free nine with the fucking song. In the function suite of the Taj Mahal. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but go and have a listen to that. It's um, very sort of Greek jar, if you like. Mm. Uh, Jean Michel jar, not fucking jam jar. Greek, a very Greek theme this week. Yeah. <laughs> We've gone a bit Greek. We're quite We're international. So, aye. That, that's my two bobs. Well, Cracking bunch of lads. Did somebody have Masaka for their tea? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what sparked this off? <laughs> it's funny, Stu, when you Skype called me the other day and you, we were talking about them uh, air tracks that I picked up. This is another one on the Greek theme. Demis Roussos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that? What's your song with you? Forever and ever and ever yeah. and ever I'll be your love. That's a copyright strike. <laughs> As demonetized the entire uh, podcast. <laughs> You know, there was I, I was going to pick, um, and and kind of went away from it. One of my my initial first pick here was going to be Billy Cobham's Spectrum album, which although not in any way, shape, or form metal, <coughs> and it's you all right there, Bill? There's a lung on the floor there. <laughs> when, we're, when we're talking about like doing non-metal albums, I was kind of thinking that was my first go-to pick. And despite the fact that it's effectively a jazz record, it to me it still feels metally because <laughs> it's full of like shredding guitar solos and keyboard solos and intricate drum patterns and stuff. And even though it's not metal, to me it's still metal. But then if you listen to Sabbath, that's a lot of jazz in that. Yeah, it's jazz. a lot of jazz in Sabbath. Oh, yeah. Bill Ward's a jazz drummer. And that's why Sabbath without Bill Ward doesn't really work. It's good, but it's not quite right, as a famous one <coughs> once said. Because it doesn't have that jazz swing. Yeah. Modern drummers don't do that, because drummers from those those kind of days were listening to... Oh, God, what's his name? Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich, that's it, yeah. Gene Krupa. Gene Krupa, those were those guys, yeah, and they were all, they all brought yeah. up on those guys. Incredible drummers. And they had a swing that... And that's why the 70s are... The 70s sound different to the 80s for that reason. That's why you had the best drummers out of the 70s. 100%. 100%. Not Phil's in the 70s. What? Very much... The drumming was predominantly Phil's. If you listen to everything. It was lead lead drumming. There's a lot of Phil's. Lead drumming. Phil Phil Taylor. Phil... (laughs) (laughs) Phil Collins. Keith Moon. Keith, Keith Moon never played a beat in his life. <laughs> Didn't do one single beat. All never. Fills. It was all Phil's with Keith Moon. Mm-hmm. He was trying to show off what he could do. Keith Moon played the drum. Oh, well, cover what he couldn't do. <laughs> Keith played to the outside then. Yeah. You're, you, I mean, like, your first proper proper big hitter guy is probably Bonham, I mean, isn't it? It's like... I Isn't think even, even then there's still that jazz swing. Phil Rudd. Yeah. Charlie Watts. Mm. No, Charlie Watts is just a straight forward, really. Aye, that's what, that's what I'm meaning, though. The, most stu- the first kind of straight ahead guy was probably him. Mm. Ringo, you don't count, because obviously a child could have done what he did. <laughs> Ringo, uh, Ringo's drums were, again, like, like lead drums. He would do, like, melodic things and... Lots of fills and stuff like everything was punctuated by Ringo's drums, which I always th- kind of thought was kind of cool. I'm not getting into talking about the Beatles. You know, it's <laughs> sucking me into that trap. <laughs> because you know all the songs. I know, but I can't help but know all the songs. <laughs> exactly. Constantly they've, pummeled into my brain. They're like 
I don't think anybody's born now who doesn't have, isn't born with an instant knowledge of all Beatles music. Oh yeah, they are. My kids don't know, and they hate them too. Good lads. I bet you they know them all. You could put nah. on any song and they'll just instantly start singing it. They know Yellow Submarine because they learned it in school. Because <laughs> it's children's yep. music. I like the Beatles. Simple as. I like the Beatles. Fuck the Beatles. <laughs> there's your, there's your tagline for this week's episode named Fuck the Beatles. I'll get some hits. Just like you fucking will if you keep that pattern up. <laughs> no, I'm a Stu. I'm a, I'm a Beatles fan. Like. Nah, that's, a that's a different topic. Best of gear. How did we get the fucking drummers to. How did, <laughs> How, how did we Ringo. get here? Ringo. I don't know how to get here. Yeah. Boy, good Ringo's a fucking cheese and onion one. <laughs> but. Ringo's are shit now. They used to be amazing. They're not good anymore. They've changed the recipe. <laughs> we say this all the time about crisps and shit. It's just got old. They're all the same. We're just... <laughs> fucking Mars bars aren't smaller. We've got bigger hands. <laughs> <laughs> That euphemism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I'm a curly whirly is the same size it ever was. I think this is probably the best point to segue into the next topic. Yes. Which is what to The next thing we're going to talk about is oh. artists or albums or anything really who had a great comeback. So, like, what's your best comeback album or band and why? Who's first? We'll just start the same direction again. So, Richie, you can go first, bud. I know what he's okay. going to pick. Do you know? Yeah, I know what Billy's going to pick, too. Stu's a wild card. <laughs> well, define a comeback album. Uh, some, well, I think it's disappeared for a while and then came back. <laughs> it could be a band that disappeared for a long time and then came back, or it could be a band that was shit for a long time. Yeah. And then came back with an absolute killer album. If, um, they, if they were tanking and then somehow made a kind of recovery, or they broke up and then go back together, you know. Reunion came back with a great album. That kind of thing. That would define the comeback. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe I'm bending the rules a little bit, but oh, God. considering all the shit that he went through in the two years before the previous album, Namely, spending months in a coma after wrapping a jaguar around a tree. Uh, the death of family members, being ripped off, losing his home in an earthquake. He has my nomination. Oh, I'm, I'm wrong. Odyssey by Yngwie Malmsteen. Is that a comeback? Is it, I mean, his last Instead of what he went through, I think it is a comeback album. He's, what, was that, what was the album before that? The album previously was Trilogy. trilogy. And that, that was a that was a smash. That was a good album, yeah. No, nah, you're not having that. That ain't a comeback. Mm-mm. Considering what he went through, I think that's a comeback record. It's a personal comeback, but not a musical comeback. Yeah. That's not what I expected you to pick, Richie. <laughs> pick the one I expected you to pick. Well, he didn't expect me to pick Greek folk music earlier, did he? Nobody fucking expected that. Nobody watching this <laughs> podcast expected to have their ears tainted with that. But that's done now. None of us can unsee that. <laughs> you could just have stopped. You could just have stopped at the first part of that sentence, there, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so right, okay, yep, just, that, just, I, just justify it. Justify oh. it. It's probably his most commercially accessible record for starters. I mean, it, it had the single on it, "Heaven Tonight," which I incidentally own on 12-inch picture disc. Um. I do, I do feel a bit like, as referee here, I'm going to have to once again make you pick up oh. a fucking record. I foul, Richie. I think that's a foul. Because, aye, oh. it, 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 he, was, he was doing really well and then did better. Yeah, that ain't, nah. Come on, Richie, pick the one that you were supposed to pick. <laughs> you turn around, turn, around, turn around and get it. We can talk about Ingvy because it's a great album, but it's not really a comeback album. One of my views it is, but um, I can't really think of any other ones, to be honest. I can't. Um, I can't really think of one. Like, just off the obvious one, 
apart from the obvious one, but I, I think like the others, I think Steve will probably pick that anyway. I won't. The one you, the one I've picked, you wouldn't even have heard it yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, so, author record? it's so true, cult. It's not even been invented yet. It's not even, <laughs> it's not even going to be released. It's not even going to be released. You're not even going to hear it. Nobody else is going to hear it. <laughs> it's so cult. It's unbelievable. So far, I'm not Should we move? Should we move on and allow Richie some time to consider the error of his ways <laughs> and see if he can redeem himself in a okay. couple of minutes' time? Well, I'll, I'll probably fuck it up as well. <laughs> Back to Richie. Uh, right Can I now. just find out? This is this has still got the price tag on it. Look, look, <laughs> look. Don't that's don't even to... point. Don't even. That, right, that's it. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? Next up is going to be me. I think. Uh, Let us do. I am going to pick uh, Rush. Mm. And mm. I What's the comeback? Vapor Trails. Now I'm a fairly new Rush fan, so yeah, I knew you were going to give us some me. give us some background here. So Vapor Trails came out. Um, oh, what year was it? Two thousand. This is dead air, so I'm going to fill it up just by making noises whilst I look this up on my phone. Let me ask, as a, again, as a relatively new Rush fan, is this post Neil Peart's daughter dying? Yeah. So With Vapor Trails came out in two thousand and two. And it was the first album they'd done since Test for Echo in 1996, when Neil Peart's daughter had died. So Rush, to all intents and purposes, were over. And um, there was no no talk of them ever getting back together. It was just accepted that Rush were done. Nobody was expecting them to come back. And yet they just reappeared. And not only that, I think Vapor Trails, whilst it's got its faults, and so much so that they re-released it a couple of years ago as a remixed version, because the first version has like digital clipping on it. So when it was mm. it mastered originally, it was mastered too loud and or mixed too loud, one of the two, and he ended up with like the loudness war thing happening. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of digital clipping, so they went in and did a remix of it. Which you can get, it's called Vapor Trails Remixed, I think, to be honest. And you can buy it. Fine. It does sound better than the original release, I think. But it was such a great album as a pump. Uh, I mean, everybody kind of knew that Geddy Lee and Alex Lifeson could still play and they still had their chops because they'd done wee bits and pieces, they'd done like solo things and in the interim. But the, the wild card was Neil Peer and Nobody had seen or heard of Neil since, like, 1996. He'd off his bike, didn't he? Yeah, and nobody really knew what he was going to do. And, like, the first single they released and, the, like, the teaser that was put out and it went out on a couple of radio stations at the same time played it. And this was, like, you had to find this on the internet. This was before you could just tune in your DAB and that was, it wasn't really a thing, you, you know. So you had to, like, look online and... He did like a syndicated launch of the song One Little Victory as the single, which opened up with some of the most ferocious sounding drums you've ever heard in your life, when Neil Peart just fucking nailing this double kick thing on the drums. And this was the opener. And to hear after like, what, 12 years, or whatever the fuck it was, six years, when was it? Six years since they'd done it. Yes. Oh no, six, no, no, six. Yeah. Uh, six years since they'd done a thing and then to just when they, they announced this is the new Rush single and you heard those drums come in you knew that this band meant fucking business and then this beast and riff came in and off they just went into Rushland but I mean it's great it's probably my favourite of the the post reunion Rush albums for songs anyway it, it suffers from you know all albums of that time where too they're long. ever so slightly too long. You know, Rush Rush always made perfect length albums. So they're always like the kind of forty five minute length kind of a record. And then as they got into C D territory like everybody else, they just started yeah. too many tracks on records. Um, never never that 
not that they were awful songs, but it's just like you could just trim them down to make them yeah. more sleek album. But that aside, I mean, it, it's outstandingly good. The songs are killer. The playing was outstanding. Um, if you've never heard Vapor Trails and you, if you're a fan of Tool, which I am not a huge fan mm, of Tool, not really familiar. But Tool and Rush have a crossover in sound in this era. Where I can, I can see that how, how that would be. Yeah, I, can, I imagine there's probably a crossover in fan base as well. Yeah, um, it's into that. It's like it, they became super heavy for for like some old ass guys. Yeah. Know? And out music that heavy is, is impressive, you know. Uh, physically demanding on Neil Peart to do those drum patterns, mm. insane, you know. But uh, yeah, Vapor Trails by Rush, top notch stuff. Check it out. Check out One Little Victory. I mean, that's that's the song you need to hear. It's it's something. Watch the Russian Rio live version of it, where the dragon hits the fire across the stage when that starts. Wow. Go saw on. the five on that tour, amazing. Maybe it was a victim of the times, but I remember that record being quite heavily panned by folk because it didn't have any guitar solos. It didn't have a lot of guitar solos, it didn't. When was this? What year were we talking? 2002. St. Anger kind of thing. Yeah, guitar solos were out. <laughs> and I think there's a couple of solos on it, but they're not like, not few mix, they're not tons of shredding or anything. And yet, Life's and kind of got it back a wee bit more in the next record. It was a little bit more, and it just it was like the sound of three guys getting back for a long period of time and just knocking some stuff out. So I think they they, they took it from the they kind of started at that level again and then just kind of went back up again with their chops. So justifiable as a comeback because they had a massive. Layoff. Well, I mean, they, they were done. Yeah. Well, Essentially split as a band. Have you ever watched the Rush Beyond the Lighted Stage? Watched it last week. It's a great documentary. It's an amazing documentary, but they talk about really it. Really good. Geddy and Alex yeah. were literally of the opinion that they were never going to rock again. That was it. It was finished. And then they were, they were surprised when Neil got back in touch and was like, let's do something, you know? From what, like, again, from I'm, I've not delved in massively deeply but since the lockdown happened I've been listening to a lot of Rush but I, I kind of started it and then went off and then kind of dipped back in and I, I'm not hearing anything bad no I don't I don't see I don't see them as a band that had a lot of duffs they, they didn't they, they were always at the, at the peak you know yeah and they were always moving forward that's what yeah. I like about Rush a lot is every album from one to the next was a was a leap forward they were always expanding the sound and trying something new and it generally always worked, but they were always pushing against the curve. They weren't following trends. They were they were pushing the boundary out that everybody else followed. And I can imagine they probably had a lot of pressure after like Spirit of Radio came out. The record label must have been saying, lads, we've got a hit here. Let's have another one. <laughs> and they didn't really do it. They just went, nah, we're going to do this thing. Well, I mean, the same thing happened with 2112. Mm. <laughs> well, 2112 was nearly... That was nearly it for them. That was like their make or break moment, wasn't it? Uh, that was to have a sleep. This is so what, what's happened here is we're discussing a band that has a drummer that doesn't play in four four all the time and bills <laughs> bills out. Tommy Lee, Tommy Lee, Tommy Lee. There he is. He's back in the room. He's back yeah. in the room. He's we're back having, in the room. We're having an actual musician chat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, right. Okay, I think we can we can probably move on there unless we, we can go down a rush hole. We should probably move on. There's a there's a whole show about Rush Easy to be done. <laughs> I'm down for that. I've never I'll heard that album so far. Be be <laughs> All right, right. There there's your challenge for the day, Richie. Go and listen to Vapor Trails. I'm gonna. Yeah. What's the? I'm trying to find out what the the remix version was called. Um. Do, do, do. It's called. It's just called Vapor Trails Remixed. Coming. Yeah. Um, slightly different version, uh, different cover, and um, Alex Lifeson did a, a remix of it because they weren't that happy with the original mix. But oh, it's... long enough. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> some stuff out. I'm gonna grab a quick beer and I'll be right back. Yeah. Hi. Wait. You're up next. <laughs> 
<laughs> you've got you've got no interest in any rush, Bill. No, never again. <laughs> Watched an interview with your man here one time, and he just pulled the pants off me. I'm no saying by any stretch of the imagination it's not great drummer. He fucking was. That's undisputable. Um, but it was just a boring past. Finest drummer to ever pick up. Happy John Henry. Well, uh, that's uh, that's the debate. Good debate over top. Shut up. <laughs> well, Neil, Neil Peart certainly had a longer career. Bonham. Fucking, there's your man. We're not we're not debating Bonham <laughs> against Peart, are we? <laughs> Come on, lads. <laughs> there's no need because there's only going to ever be fucking one winner oh, I don't know what side of the fence I would fall on that's hard I can't really pick between them they're two different drummers but two yeah. awesome good drummers I've, I've, got to, I've got to say Peart's a better drummer I don't think you can question that Peart had technically technically I he had more just to, a bit on ability yeah but Bonham's Bonham and Peart isn't he Bonham, Bonham has a unique feel. Yeah, this and a sound. But Neil Peart's a more musical drummer. But it's, you, you, I, again, you can't compare because Bonham died way right. too soon. What would he have done going on? You know what I mean? You can't. You, you never it's, know. This is true. Bonham would hold my interest <clears throat> far longer than Neil Peart. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Again. Yeah. If you want to be super critical, if you go into the later Zeppelin catalogue, they were putting out some shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, why? Definitely. Yeah. 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 But anyway, that, that's probably plenty on Rush. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have a full podcast to be done on Rush. Move around to Steve now. What have you got for us? Is it me? It's you. Right. Like I say, I changed at the 11th hour. I'm going to talk about, so we've got time, I'm going to talk about the original one that I was going to pick. So this is a probably a slightly controversial one. I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Um, and I was going to pick it on Death Magnetic. Ooh. Now, interestingly, if you listen to Death Magnetic, not that great an album. But like, in today's standard, it's probably, is it average? Maybe even, don't even, even call it, it sounds average. shite, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it, it clips. Um... The snare still sounds horrible, but if you take it into its context, so it came out in 2008, so where were Metallica in 2008? We just watched them fall apart on some kind of monster. They were openly ridiculed for that video, DVD, whatever you want to call it. And then St. Anger came out, of course, and we just all fell apart in fits of laughter at Lars's snare sound, the lack of guitar solos and the whiny, whiny, poor me lyrics. So Metallica in 2008 were on their arse, really. Um, Maiden had done their comeback, so Maiden were showing them who was boss, and Metallica were kind of going the other way down. But when Death Magnet came out, it had to it had to do a thing, and if it didn't do a thing, Metallica were fucked, really. And it kind of did do it did do what you needed it to do as a Metallica fan. Two thousand eight, shit in your pants, listen to it. I can remember listening to it like, oh, fuck, please, please don't be shit, don't be in anger, and it wasn't, <laughs> and it wasn't. <laughs> And, fa- and you, you get, it gets five minutes in, and then you hear a solo from Kirk, and you're like, everything's fine, it's okay, they'll be right. And now, of course, they're fucking probably bigger than they've ever been. But had they, had they released a different album at that time, it's interesting to think where they would have gone. And it didn't have to be a great album, it just had to be a metal album with some roots and thrash. Yeah. And there's some, there's some great moments on it. That there's actually some of Kirk's best guitar playing since 88. Is on there, and I know that's not saying a lot. <laughs> I know that's not saying a lot. There's less wah, there's less wah in it too, and there's obviously some great Hetfield moments, as you would expect on having listened, having gone through the kind of load and reload years when they were trying to swing and they were trying to be crowed and confirm it and failing fucking miserably at it. It was nice to just hear some solid down picking riffs. Yeah. So I nearly picked that, but then today I listened to uh, an album by a band who have. Disappeared for, I'm just googling exactly how long. So their last record was, wow, 1991 was their last album. So 
they basically sat around for 30 odd years, 30 odd years. Uh, and that probably has some bearing on this. But it's a new album which just came out, I think it's just out today actually, or like this week anyway, by a band called Kirith Ungol, who you may, may or may not be familiar with. I, I had a listen literally before we started when you sent me the link. <laughs> and I, I went out for a run tonight, which is miraculous in itself, and I put that on just because it, it was out and I thought I'd have a listen to it. And fuck me, that is a good album. There are some fucking riffs on that record. Like it's, it sounds, it's, when you listen to the sound of it, it sounds like it was made in about 85. Mm-hmm. It sounds analog. It sounds, the guitars sound like they were just old cranked marshals with a flying V pushed through it. It doesn't sound like it's been anywhere near Pro Tools. So Pro Tools has not been fucking clan pasted. It doesn't sound like every shitty heavy metal record over the last, I mean, how long have metal records sounded shit? 20 years? They've been sounding shit for a long ass time. <clears throat> they sneak, they've been sounding really bad for a while. Since Death Magnetic. <laughs> nah, before that, man. <laughs> I just, when I, when I hear a record that sounds. In anger. Yeah, even before that. Pr- processed, cut and pasted, Pro Tools, everything sounds great and polished and shiny in metal. Even now. Like even, when, you hear, when you hear a death metal album that sounds polished and shiny, you know something's fucking wrong. A death metal album should sound like it was dragged out of your arse, kicking and screaming. Shouldn't sound fucking shiny. So this album sounds old and analog, like early made, and the bass is really prominent. You can hear the bass pumping away like at the front of the mix, and just great riffs and vocally. Your man Tim Baker hasn't lost a note, but again, done fuck all for thirty years. That's probably why he's not been touring the world for thirty years, banging it out every night when he probably shouldn't have been. But if you listen to Kerith Angle's last record, which is called Paradise Lost in nineteen eighty one. And then listen to it next to this one. There's, there's no difference. Voice is the same. Granted, I only, I only got to listen to like, you know, a quick kind of twenty minutes skip through of it, but it was bangingly good. I will go back for another listen. I mean, there were there were just moments where I was like running with my jaw on the floor. The riffs, I was like, how did he like, like even now, like, when every riff's been done, really, how do you come up with stuff that still still sounds new? but old it's amazing so that's my comeback because I mean being out of the game for 30 years to come back and they're a massively influential back in our, our little scene where we fall into the kind of more trad metal scene Kurt Ungle Manila Road are both two huge bands. and I think they've, they've come back and pretty much smoked every other band on the scene with that album and I, I say that after on a cursory list I'm not listening to it a lot a couple of times through but it's really fucking good. It's got so, that kind of, it's got the that slight X factor thing that a lot of bands don't have, where you play an album and you just think it sounds like anybody else in the scene at the, any one time. That that has a has a unique sound to. It. Yeah, it, it sounds. I think a lot of that's the vocals. The vocals are probably a bit of an acquired taste. Yeah, it's a very harsh version of like a har a Halfordy scream. You, you, probably, probably a big influence on the kind of black metal scene. Yeah, think. There's, there's probably an, it's not black metal vocals by any stretch. It's not it's, it's traditional heavy metal, fantasy tinged heavy metal. But there probably wasn't really anyone around at that time. The first album came out in '81 that had that sort of screechy, harshy kind of. Well, King Diamond maybe, maybe King Diamond. There's a similarity there. Um, there's a German crossover. I think the thing with Kurt Ungle as well is they, they really kind of missed the boat. Like their first album came out in 81 and then their next one was 84. And by that time in the States, Metallica had released Kill 'em All and Trad Metal was done. It was thrash. And they kind of fell foul of management deals, and as, as all bands do, yeah. fell foul of all that kind of shit. And they should really have been bigger than they were. A lot of the, the, the bands that were on Metal Blade, which they are and yeah, were, they seem to struggle. To break out of that kind of niche market, because it was just a weird time. Because in Armored Saint, for another one, were more the trad metal sense of the world. The and world. They all put out great albums, but they yeah. never seemed to get the kind of mainstream recognition that they probably should have had. Because Metallica came out. Yeah. And went, nope, that's not what we're all about. This is what we're doing now. All of us, let's go this way. 
It was and a, everyone did. It was a sweeping motion. Yeah. Videos. That one record then Slayer went, yeah, we'll come. Anthrax went, yeah, we're coming too. Eventually Dave went, yep, I'm going to do this thing, we're going to come. And everyone else went the same way. And bands like Manila Road, Carathongal, those kind of American underground bands just got left behind. Can I just point out on that subject, regards, you know, Kill em All being a, a groundbreaker, etc. I'll just point yeah. out that Exodus is bonded, bonded by Blood was recorded first, but the release was delayed. Can you imagine how much of a game changer that would have been if that was released first? If that had come out first, that's an interesting topic, yeah. 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 But it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> You're not past the last. Them's the breaks, isn't it? Them's the fucking breaks. I mean, yeah. yeah. What would have happened if uh, Metallica had picked a different guitar player out of Exodus instead of fucking Mark Hammett and got Gary Holt instead? Gary, oh, oh, yeah, fucking Metallica with Gary Holt. That would have been something. That would have been interesting. That would have been better. It would have been better, in my opinion. <laughs> <sighs> as much as Kirk Hammett gets it tight, I think from 83 to 88, he's solid. Bob Rock, fucked, Bob Rock fucked Kirk Hammett. He was good, but no, it was, he was, you know, that's when he started actually playing on the records. Metallica, one of the most interesting bands because independently, none of them are that good. Yeah. Well, Hetfield's right hand. Yeah. But if oh, you take them, if you put them into any other band, they wouldn't cut it. Probably not. But together, they're the biggest metal band in the world. Well, well the, the bass yeah. players, the bass players, called Iron Maiden. Bass players in Metallica were always the best guys. Who were <laughs> Well, nobody really heard him play properly, so therefore you can't really judge him. Uh, but, Metallica have never replaced you know, you, never replaced There's Black. no way, I mean, you listen to them, them demos, there's no way he was in the same class as Cliff Burton or Jason Newstead, mm. or Rob Trio for that matter. But, I mean, Cliff, Cliff was something else. Uh, Newstead was a great musician, just really underrated. He was. And Trujillo is a great bass player as well. Not for Metallica. Yeah. No, it doesn't work for me personally. But he is a great bass player. Yeah, or an outstanding bass player. Probably the best Metallica I've had, but he doesn't work with Metallica. The only guy that should be playing bass in Metallica at this time right. for me is Newstead. Yeah, yeah, they, they they should have made that work. They need to get him back. Do you, do you ever see Jason, that? Jason said no to therapy. Yeah. Jason wasn't a therapy guy. No, I'm with Jason. Jason's had a, you know, his career's gone on fine. He's done plenty of stuff. He's He's happy, I think, you know. Uh, he's uh, been very quiet for a while and that Newstead project really put a dent in his finances he's not doing as well as people think no was, something bad happened with that I don't know the details but something bad happened with that he's, doing an he's acoustic, losing so much money on it you know it's still doing an acoustic thing I hope not that's really sad if he is like acoustic shit bluegrassy type stuff or some shit like that you know Jason oh, really likes better. that stuff nobody should like that you're better than that <laughs> But, I mean, he couldn't really do another metal band, I don't think, uh, Newstead, because he's always just going to be linked to Metallica. Whatever he does will, will always be put up against the Metallica glory years back catalogue. I don't know, will it? Because he wasn't really part of it. I know, he's synonymous with it, though, because he I played suppose. with Park for so many years. Yeah, I guess. I don't like Trujillo. I you did know just... You know what it doesn't work in Metallica. He's too, he's too groovy. Yeah, you know what they miss for me as well with Newstead is he's backing vocals a lot. Yeah, the harsh vocals. Yeah. yeah. You realise when you listen to them with Newstead in how much he sang. Oh, oh yeah. You know? I feel that I'm taking the mic a lot of times, man. Yeah, a yeah. lot of times. He sounded great. Mm-hmm. You know, it, they just had two voices that blended really well together. Yeah, yeah. I feel... Uh, Newstead just looked great on stage too. He looked like he was in Metallica. Yeah. Ah, uh, he looked like he was enjoying himself, really enjoying himself. Well, he was a fan, wasn't he? He was just a fan that got lucky at the end of the day. Yeah. It showed. Well, great musician. Really, really underappreciated. Metallica need a wardrobe consultant at this point. <laughs> Hetfield's feels fine. Hetfield's hey, feels rocking along. But he's got the battle jackets. He's killing it with the battle jackets. He's still wearing skinny black jeans. He's fine. Kirk's wearing his grand trousers. What's he doing? 
And Lars has got a purple drum kit. Trujillo's rocking about in basketball clothes. No, you're Metallica. You all wear black. Yeah, you don't look Metallica anymore. No, you wear black clothes, skinny ones. Uh, end of topic. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of set them off against Megadeth here, but at least Megadeth still look like Megadeth. Well, Dave still looks like Dave. <laughs> Just think back to the 1990s, though, you know, when Marty Friedman grew a pencil tash, Dave Ellison put his hair short and all that. Oh, yeah, it's like Metallica's loads years, you know, with the, the eyeliner and the... The guy eyeliner, yeah. The short hair. And let's not forget Risk. Oh, yeah. Well, everybody else has. I have it. Stuff. I've got that album somewhere. I'll listen to it once. <laughs> yeah. Not, not their finest moment. No. I mean, bands around that era were, like, metal bands were struggling. They were floundering, treading water, wondering what the fuck to do. They couldn't, they couldn't jump onto the new wave of stuff that was coming out. They were watching their careers die, and all they could do was desperately grasp for anything they could do to try and stay as relevant as possible usually but... a plaid shirt and a goatee beard usually yeah but even even Kerry King admits Slayer's Diabolus and Musica was a mistake is that the new metal one aye from 1998 I've never even heard that album it's quite Slipknot it's not it's not a great record Let, let's be Slipknot con- before Slipknot then let's be controversial here everything Slayer did after fucking the first couple of records was a mistake the rest of the career was a mistake. Not even that. I'll disagree with that. They, they, did a, they had a couple of missteps, but less than most bands of their age. Seasons of the Abyss will give you that. Rain and Blood will give you that. And then I'm done. Uh, Divine Intervention was a great record. Divine Intervention and God Hates Us All. I quite like those records. I don't know. God Hates Us All, I think, was still a bit kind of... The only, only band I've ever seen live that... Every time I've seen them live, they've got worse. I'll, I'll be honest, Slayer underwhelmed me when I saw them. I think, I've seen, seen, I think I've seen them four times now, and, and the first time was quite good. They had the Lombardo, Heinemann was still there, and every subsequent thing, they lost a member as they went along, and they just got shit. And the last time I saw them, they, just, they got blown away by the support bands. Blown away. I was bored. I'm interested to see what K King does next. Now there was talk of that super group happening with Phil and Selmo. Well, I'm trying to play the guitar, maybe. <laughs> People are, I mean, Phil and Selmo has been linked to that, and he's been linked to this Pantera tribute thing. <sighs> I don't think that. Shoot. Is that the, the, the Zach Wild thing? Yeah, Rex Brown did do it, and Zach said he'll do it, so. Whether it happens, I don't know. You're on dodgy ground with that, aren't you? You really are. I mean,. You, well, I mean, how can you win with that? How can you win if you do it as a, as a purely as a tribute? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, a you couple of one offs. Yeah, with that. But I mean, I mean, it worked for Thin Lizzy for for many years. They they did just a tribute in it every night, and that worked. Yeah, I suppose. A lot of, a lot of the pedants absolutely hate it that um, John Sykes fronted Thin Lizzy tribute. Yeah, they absolutely hated it. Um, the the rock. I, I thought they were great. They were really good. It was good, but they, like they, they always made the whole night about Phil. Every, between every song, they would talk about yes. Phil wrote this, yeah. Phil did this, and then they would do like you know, let's have a shout out for Phil. Mm. You know, it, it was the whole thing. Every night was based around this is a tribute to Phil in it. Yeah, you Which know, you sense. always made sure Phil got the biggest shout of the night. Yeah. Oh, and Sykes packed in and it was the Ricky Warwick thing I think they, they, I think they took it too far at that point. He did, because they tried to reinvent that as a new version of Thin Lizzy <laughs> it wasn't No Because nah. Thin Lizzy's film Yeah, and, and I think John knew that Yeah. I sort of vaguely remember reading an interview with Scott Gorham talking about will they ever record new material and he said that they would like to do it but John was really reticent to put anything new out under the, the Thin Lizzy name and I think that was absolutely the right decision. Rightly, so it fucks the legacy. That I think. was in a very, very early issue of Classic Rock magazine. Yeah. Um, Scott Gorham dropped the hint, and they still had Brian Downey at the time before he left. Tommy Aldridge came in, and then Brian Downey came back, 
And I remember Gary Moore absolutely ripped through them for it. Gary was really? still alive. Like, he really? absolutely so, ripped through them for you suggesting it. <clears throat> it couldn't happen. Tommy Aldridge as well, and Tim Lizzie. Nah, not having that. Not having that at all. It, it, it yeah. You can't put an 80s drummer in a 70s band. I saw and that. I, I know he's like a 70s drummer, Black Oak Arkansas, or whatever, but. Yeah, but nah. I saw them with Downey and I saw them with Tommy and I saw them with just the last time I saw them I think it was Michael Lee on drums I don't, even know that is and I don't care from the cult and Little Angels yeah I don't care um, and I think it was just before he died but it was oh, that's right. sorry that's the way. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, they were really good they had Marco Mendoza on bass no so no I'm not Oh, no, 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 no. Ah. <laughs> but but, this is another subject for a podcast is the bands that you can't even replace members with. And Lizzie were. You can't even. No. I, think I, them, I think I saw them once with Darren Wharton as well. That doesn't lend any authenticity because he's a keyboard player. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, could we could I have that from uh, the first topic of non-metal bands? So you could say the first Bear album. <laughs> no, that's that's in that's in the territory of metal. It isn't, it isn't the metal territory, but you know, yeah, that was that was a good Pop record. metal, but nah, that's in that's within the realms. I'm just going to throw something in here for people who are watching. Remember many many years ago? Well, yeah, are people watching like this. Now. yeah, <laughs> for people who are watching this when it goes out live. All oh, right. I was in a I was in a, a live venue some years back, and I heard a band cover Dare. Now you mentioned the sound, Transformers soundtrack earlier. Heard a band cover Dare by Stan Bush. Um, that was me. But I was right in the back, and I couldn't see who it was, and I had no idea that years later that it was Stu. <laughs> 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 and we're talking about the Stu, and he goes, "Yeah, that was what July 2014 and such and such." That's right, I. I know it was him at the time. Was, we we only did it. I think we did it once or twice. We did it in the dreadnought. Yeah. That, that laser pop. Yeah, we were supporting the Amorettes. Oh, was that that gig? And we supported. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so was that. <laughs> we supported the King lot as well. Um, just before we broke up, and I think we did Dare at both of those gigs. That was a great song. I think there was about 12 people there at the Dreadnought that night. What one? One with Amorettes. No, no, that was packed. Fuck, I was there. It was busy. <laughs> it was busy. It was very busy. I was there with me and Stuart. Ah, uh, it must have been a different gig then. And I was up fucking dead. No, no, it was it was a busy night. That was a packed one. Yeah. The, the first time they'd played the, the Dread and like a year or something it was like a big comeback gig anyway I digress moving on yeah I remember I punched somebody outside that night <laughs> middle hmm middle can I hear you Billy it doesn't matter <laughs> go on right, well. <laughs> I think that takes us round to Bill with his comeback record. All right, I'm just going to go obvious and say firepower. Because mm. it's a monster. Oh. Or uh, except you, you, you could probably you could probably count firepower simply because what was the album before it with Austin? Mm-hmm. No. no. Redeemer of, Redeemer of Souls. Right. Hmm. Angel of Retribution was the... Angel, Angel of Retribution was the comeback. comeback. And then there was Notre Dame, and then Redeemer of Souls, and then Firepower. Oh, I don't know. I don't, I if, think if you're sure in Odyssey. That, that's a yellow card there, Bill. I hope you. You, you, you could have got away with Angel of Retribution, but it's shit. But uh, the, uh, to the other hand... Did Bill pick Firepower? Did. I fucking knew it. I fucking knew it. You were going to pick that or Blood of the Nations? Blood of the Nations you can have. I thought you were going to pick that. 
That's definitely a comeback, and it's a fucking great comeback. It is. I was going to pick Blood of the Nations for myself, but I'm playing a hard role with myself, and it's albums that I only own in physical form, and I don't own that on vinyl, CD, or cassette. <laughs> so tell us, tell us about Blood of the Nations by Accept, Bill. Go for it. I was listening to it today, and it's just a fucking monster of a thing. And there's not a bad song on it. Absolutely not one bad track on that album. It's start to finish, it's just fucking solid. It's got one, of the, solid. one of the best opening songs ever. Definitely. Absolutely. And then the song after that's good, and the song after that's good, and the song <laughs> after that's good, and the song after that's good. They're yeah. all fucking, they're all good. Yeah, I, I don't think I there's any, that nothing weak on that effort. No, absolutely not. It's a banger in an album. Every, every metal fan should own it. Is is it? And I, I'm I'm falling into the opinion that it's possibly Accept's best album ever. Oh, I mean that lineup just it's it not. just works so well. You're gonna disagree there. I'm gonna have to because their best album is probably Metal Heart. You think? Mm-hmm. I I like Metal Heart. I'm not gonna say I don't like Metal Heart because I love the Metal Heart. But Blood of the Nations. Just more bangers start to finish. I've got the track list in front of me. It starts off to beat the bastards. Fuck. That's how you should start a fucking album. Moves on to Chitonic Terror. Keeping the theme going. Fucking push. You're getting it, mate. The Abyss. Fucking hello. Uh, what else? We've got Shades of Death. That was my fucking... Uh, that was my alarm for getting me up. <laughs> for about fucking six months. Uh, so, hi, every song on that album, fuck it, go ahead. We've got the topical song. Pandemic. <laughs> Pandemic. <laughs> Which is great. Uh, so, every song on that album um, is a beast. Yeah, I'll go along with that. As I say, the line-up, that, the line-up for that album, uh, band-wise, is exceptional. It's probably the best line-up Except I've ever had, without question. I, I'm inclined to agree. Mark Tornello's vocals are just fucking. I mean, how old is he? He's about fucking six hundred, <laughs> and his voice oh, is amazing. This is a good album. <laughs> it's, it's so good, but it's fucking made Richie leave the room. He had to go for a shit. He's <laughs> celebrating it. I had to go for a big Jordy dump. What's your, what's nice for that give, give us your thoughts on Blood of the Nations by Accept, Richie. Well, I don't own it, but I've uh, heard it many a time because it's so bloody good. You know? It's a fantastic. When you look at Accept's output in the 1990s, it's three albums with the occasional good track on it. Blood of the Nations complete package yeah um, especially when you consider a lineup change as well and so, so many parents who say no Udo no accept well they're wrong of course they're wrong <laughs> and in addition to that they've kept it consistent because there's been three since and they've all been bangers not as good as the Lord of the Nations but Aye. fucking good in the right that's kind of been my opinion of Accept's last couple of records, is they're still really good, but they've never quite captured the songs of Blood of the Nations. It's just, it's it's the best collection of songs they've done since the comeback. I have the interesting fact here in front of me from Wikipedia. I didn't actually realise this. Uh, it's the band's first studio recording since 1996. Right Mm-hmm. Which was a shit record. That's a mighty long time to be without any recorded music and still be able to fucking pull it off when they come back. Well, there's there's the great interview with um, I can't remember. Is it Wolf Hoffman? That the Wolf Hoffman. There's somebody. It was on Razor Fist's Metal Mythos. Where they're talking about um, 
it might have been Andy Sneap they were interviewing with somebody and they were talking about how they, when they'd gone in to do the sessions for Blood of the Nations, they'd gone in with some like songs and stuff and Sneap basically just turned around and told them this isn't good enough and then he sent them away with homework and stuff to, you know, start picking apart their back catalogue and their songs to like try and explain to them how they used to write good songs and how to get back to that. Looking for those little pushes and things like that in the rhythm section that make accept sound like accept. Yeah. And and if if like, you know, Predator and stuff, these kind of records if, if that was what they were coming in with at that time, you would just have been like you would not have seen them coming back with a record as good as that. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a banger, like Absolute monster. Monster! <laughs> it's it's one like Billy. What? Yeah. It was one that I was, like I said earlier, it was one I was considering, but because I don't physically own it, I had to scratch it from your own list. I'm just Captain Obvious. That's an acceptable answer. I think everybody's an acceptable <laughs> It's a killer. Acceptable. Hey. Hey. Oh, the- you can't have firepower. <laughs> as great as that album is, you can't have firepower. No. Lucky, lucky I had the backup then. Why are we saying firepower wasn't a comeback? No. Because of Angel of yeah, because of Dr. Damp- yeah, fuck, what was the album called? Angel of Retribution. Was that the last one? Redeemer of Souls. Redeemer of Souls. Redeemer yeah. of Souls, sorry. <clears throat> yeah. Which I don't really like. It's a good album, it's not a great album because it's a bit, it's, it's, the, it's an out of band kind of finding their, their way with kind of Richie going in. I think to be honest, I mean, KK. there's some good songs on it, it's too long and it's a bit meandering. Between Firepower and Painkiller, uh, I would struggle to pick uh, an album by Judas Priest I would consider a great record. You what? I don't think anything they released between Painkiller oh. and... Uh, Angel like, Retribution is not... It's not good. Average. Nostradamus is pretty Nostradamus well. isn't fairly good either. And neither is Redeemer of Souls. Redeemer of Souls is them getting them back on the right track again. It's a little bit better. It's about a half good album for me. And then... It, uh, yeah, yeah Meanders. Yeah. It, 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 it Valhalla, like, Halls of Valhalla is a great, a great song. Um, there's a couple of great songs on it, but yeah. It's... It becomes a bit forgettable. Aye. As yeah. did it for Retribution. And Nostradamus just wasn't really a... I can understand why a brand like Priest would want to do a concept album, but they shouldn't ever want to do a concept album, <laughs> because it's not... It was a lesson learned there. Plus, it, we lost fucking KK Downing on the back of it, so it, it, that's not a good thing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what his next recording is going to be like. KK. That's going to be really interesting. Yeah, I really want to hear that because KK's chops have not dropped. He's he's exceptionally good still. He's if anything better than he was. I mean the live stuff that I've seen with KK's yeah. priest has been fucking outstanding. Even the bloodstock thing he did with Ross the Boss from Man of War was really good. Like they, they were, KK they, can still shred. It would be an interesting thing for Mickey Crystal to join. Yeah. <laughs> New Dis Priest. Yeah. <laughs> he could be their, their own version of Richie Faulkner um, there's an interesting point yeah that'll, that'll be a, a good one to see what they do if they do record stuff will they record are they gonna yeah they're doing an album they've done an album doing, have they that'll be interesting the last before we went into lockdown I saw KK had, and Ripper I think had posted that they were listening to the recorded tracks That's and they were went into mixing yeah, it'll be good. I think it'll be good to see KK kind of do his own thing without being. I think I think it'll it'll show how much of a contribution KK really made to Priest. Yeah, I, th- I think he's been underplayed a lot in recent. A bit, yeah, a little bit. And his book was interesting. Obviously, it's Aye, it was. It's from his own perspective, so it's, yeah. he's only a pinch of salt. You, but um, there, there was a lot of things you definitely pick out of it. Like he he did kind of get pushed to the back a little bit. And I think that's kind of unfair because if you listen to any Judas Priest stuff, you can hear what he played on those records. He was so good, and he he probably should have been pushed to the forefront a little more at times. 
Yeah, totally. He gave it a more Hendrixy vibe, probably like a more of a looser kind of thing. It's like the what we talked about last week with the Iron Maiden thing, having Adrian Smith and Dave Murray having two contrasting styles, giving yeah. them both equal billing as the lead guitar players, really mm-hmm. made for great music. Yeah. And I think Priest, at their best, was when they had KK ripping and then Glenn ripping as well. You know, yeah. you did them together, it was just great. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's guitar bands with a two guitar lineup band they, they have to remember that you're a team and there's you're no, one guitar player yeah there's no one person should be really above the other it should be it's a it's a team everything you do should be to make the guitars sound better together as one as striker said but that's <laughs> why you'll never see like when they have these like, guitar poles you'll never see any of the guitar teams being best guitarist no they always get overlooked. You know, you Glenn Tipton, Dave Murray, they never get to the top because of the fact that they're part of a team. Yeah. They're considered as part of a whole. But that's what makes their bands great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the great teamed you know, Robbo and Gora. Oh, was the, yeah, that was the, the pinnacle. They, they, they played yeah. so differently, but together they were just killer. And, Lizzie and, never beat that. Lizzie never got better than that. No. <clears throat> I mean, on that subject, I don't think had he not have broken solo and stayed with the band longer, I don't think Gary Moore would have had the, uh, you know, elevation like he does had he not have gone solo. And the same, I, I would say the same for John Sykes as well. Had he not gone and done this soul guitar thing with White Snake and Blue Murder, yeah, I think had he stayed with Lizzie for longer and maybe done the Room Ed reunion that was supposed to take place. Instead of doing that, um, I don't think he would have been as highly acknowledged as he is. Oh, definitely. I think it takes a particular kind of guitar player to play as part of a team, though. It's not an easy thing to do. Like, It's easy to be the guitar player and be the guitar god. But it's hard to be... There's Billy tapping out again because we're talking about <laughs> musical instruments. He, he hits pots and pans for a living. <laughs> <laughs> it's tougher way. Tougher I mean, like, not disparaging anybody I've ever played with before at any point, but like most of the bands I've been in, I have been generally the only guitar player. And and the times I've played with other people, it's been difficult. Um, <coughs> finding somebody that you can play with <laughs> when you're playing <laughs> when you're playing the same instrument. Yeah, <laughs> such fucking children and that's why it works <laughs> yeah, this is exactly why it works because we could talk shit like this because we're all fucking idiots it's true though you like you have to you become a team you know it's like a, a thing you have to let go of a bit of your own ego for the sake of the song yeah, you can't really have an ego. No. It doesn't really work if you do it with an ego. You, you Unless you leave half the band. I, I, feel like kind of, I feel like Priest kind of went to the point where they were kind of not doing one thing or the other. Like I think you didn't need to have lead in rhythm or you need to have lead too. But they kind of went to the stage where sometimes Glenn was the lead guy and KK was the rhythm guy. Sometimes he let KK come forward. I think that's where it kind of fell off, like what you yep. were saying there. Needs to be one or the other. You know, a Metallica kind of job, rhythm and lead works. Yeah. Whereas in the earlier Priest albums, there was more of a, an equal distribution of stuff. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's why they sound so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that note. Ah, no. We're up at the two hour mark now. Ah, that's, a, that's a long cast. Yeah, this is longer than last week's one. <laughs> while, while we're discussing it, I know I know you you didn't particularly like my choice. While oh, we're discussing shit. it, I went and picked out um I went and picked out two more that could be, shall we say, an act of redemption. Right, go on then. Let's have a swap. Is it Volume Two? <laughs> what? Boran Rhythms <laughs> by the Apple Care um, Orchestra. 
music from the Balkans. <laughs> from the balls. Sometime. Hey, stop padding your part, get it out. Get it on here. Eight years, eight years away. Um, major lineup changes. A £60 million record company lawsuit. And yet, this album spawned a number one single. Boys on. Boston. Third stage. Uh. Had the highest chart and single. Number one on the billboards. Okay. And they were away for eight years. They were. I'll, I'll kind of give you that. Oh. It's it, not an album I particularly listen to a lot. It's not their best. It's not their best. No. I think Boston are always... The, Everybody knows that. Yeah. Boston will always struggle with the fact that the, the first album is just effectively their own greatest hits in one album. <laughs> I always get that mixed yeah. up with Total. I never know which is which. Oh my! Like Boston's first album is just insanely good. Oh my Africa on it. No, it's you never heard that record, Steve. Uh, no. Oh man, you, that right? That's no, that. That's probably that's that's really like it. Work. I would like it. I, I, I you, probably, you would. What's the Boston one? Is it Rosanna? Yeah, Boston was more than a feeling. <laughs> Who did Rosanna? Total. Total. See, it's the same fucking thing. Yeah. Uh, but I uh, listen to the first Boston album. Yeah. I think I probably have. I've definitely oh, listened, I've listened to the first Total album. Make, make, a, make a point of, of going away and re-listening to it. In fact, like, we were talking about things like Hallis and the guitar tones and stuff on these yeah, kind of... the retro kind of stuff. Boston, best guitar sound ever. It's just... Tom Schultz's guitar stuff and that is just exceptional. Right, I'll give that a crack. I'll probably like that, I would imagine. You will. Every, like about AOR. every song is immense. There's no bad songs in Boston's first album. None. Every song on that could have been a single. And, yeah. Yeah. Was that not a complete solo effort? Almost. <laughs> not quite. Mm, Almost. That's all that fucking Jeff Lynne. He didn't, he didn't Depends play the drums. Depends on who you believe. You know. He didn't play the drums in it. He didn't sing in it. I think That's a point, actually. That the drums that played stage were all um, recording samples and then splicing them together with tape. He, he did that on most of the records, so didn't he? He did that on Don't Love Back as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other backup, in case he didn't uh, accept that one, the other backup, and Steve probably expected me to pick that one, was this. I can't yeah, I, was, I, I nearly picked it. <laughs> That Brave New World by Iron Maiden. Yeah, that, that's yeah. the ultimate comeback album, isn't it? Really. I like, have... like I said, I'm only I'm only picking albums which I physically own. So you have to kind of explain this, I suppose, because like this is an audio podcast as well. So if people are watching, they're not watching it. They're not going to have a clue what you're doing. Yeah, Brave, <laughs> Brave New World. New World was... Brave New World was a great record. What the purposes of the tape, my lad? It was aye. It was. Maiden were in the old drums, really, and they had to do something to get them out of that, and that was that was it. It's my last great Maiden album that I'll listen to, that I'll still listen to. It's probably put my objective hat on, which is hard when I'm a Maiden fan. <laughs> but it probably is the last classic. I it, it, had Wicker Man, which is just an outstandingly good song. Yeah, the best and intro Smith, it? to any live show ever. Maiden at Rock and Wheel, opening with the Wicker Man. Oh, aye. chills. Major chills. What? Spaffage everywhere. I know. Aye. Awesome. Oh, aye. I think the, the, the intro is from A Knight's Tale. I think. What was that? Aye. <laughs> um, and then it just fucking. <laughs> oh, fucking outstanding. It's the best intro ever in a live show. It shows how much they missed Adrian Smith. Yeah. That whole record actually shows how much they miss him. The groove went. The groove went when he went. Mm. It also takes takes back earlier. I mean, when we talked about electronic music and Van Gelis, etc. Um, and they used the Blade Runner theme as the intro music for the Somewhere in Time tour. That whole record was kind of Blade Runner-y inspired, wasn't it? It was that was a kind of that vibe. 
Look at the end scene. I was even had Tyrell Corp on the back yeah. sleeve. Well, they're they're standing with the, the flying car thing from Blade Runner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great record. Great record. Like on the spinner. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I almost picked. Uh, I was almost going to pick Van Halen. Funnily enough. What for a comeback? New tattoo. Uh, they've not come back yet. They did. No, no. Which one? Come... New, new tattoo. Different... They've not come back since 1984. A different kind of truth was a massive comeback. No, it was fucking terrible though. No, 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 no. no. Great it's been terrible since 84. <laughs> That, that's the album with new tattoo on it, isn't it, Steve? Ah, 51 yeah. 50. I'll give you 51 50. Shit's insane. Oh, like, my dad would be happy with that. He absolutely loves Sammy Hager. I like 5150. It's a good album. Yeah, too. Yeah. I, really I like, like Van Halen. I like. Uh, the only Sammy Hager album that Van Halen did that I really didn't like hugely is OU812. Right. Um, I, I thought that was alright. It's patchy. It's just. It sounds again like a band who's just knocked up some demos and fired them out without any real thought as to making an album. Mm. It's the only Van Halen album I think that's got quite a lot of filler in it. Nah, there's loads of filler on them. All the covers. No, no, they they made covers their own. You know? Nah, they did. They were shit at covers. Oh. You really got me as a rubbish fucking cover. That They're... one you sent that night was a rubbish cover. That whole cover album they did was full of rubbish covers. Um, Diver Down uh, uh, well, I don't know <laughs> the one with the fucking is it Diver Down with the Roy Orbison cover on it yeah yeah Pretty Women oh, oh shit oh, I think it's a great shit. cover dog shit yeah. waste of vinyl you've been better putting that on your floor I, didn't like, the, 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 I never liked Pretty Women with the fucking original either. well no it's a crap song but I mean it's a lazy I think Van Halen are a lazy band <laughs> quite a lazy band Hasn't well, that also got um, Where All The Good Times Gone On as well? Aye, that was shit, I know. Oh, which is a kink song. Yeah. Aye. Bubbish. Just leave it. Just leave it. The original was fine. Big Bad hey. Bill. Fuck off. <laughs> Happy Trails. <laughs> Overrated bands. That's what we need to do next. And Van Halen will be pretty high up. Uh, Van Halen's not on my overrated list for certain. I, I, I love Van Halen. Take away Ed Shred, you're left with a mediocre rock band. No way. Best, very, very mediocre. Best front man that ever was, and a drummer who was... But that's only live. I'm, I'm talking about the albums. Oh, no, you're wrong. You're so wrong. <laughs> Medio- mediocre songs. Great guitar playing, probably one of the best ever lived. But in terms of the songwriting, it's all right. The first... In fact, all the Dave Lee Roth albums were... There's, uh, to me... Nah, the first one in 1984, that's all you're having. Um, fuck off! Nah, the rest of them pish. I've listened to more of pish. Well, poor, is, poor, poor. First is amazing. Phoned in. It's phoned in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I can't even yeah. tell at this point if Where's you're Van Halen. Oh. <laughs> I'm I'm not I, I'm not I don't really get Van Halen. I get the invented fucking modern guitar player and, and all that shit, but it's maybe it's too American for me. I don't really like a lot of American bands. Really? I like American bands that sound European. I like them. Um, like Metallica. But I can't. What? Van, Van Halen just are really, really American y. Really Californian. Like they could only. We were talking about this the other day. They could only come for California. Yeah. Van Halen couldn't have come for Droitwich. Soft rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's surf rock. I just can't relate to it, I think. Because <laughs> I've never seen a surfboard. I've seen an ironing board, and that's as close as I'm ever going to get. So, yeah, not a Van Halen guy. I'll, I'll turn you around eventually. I managed to get you in a rush, so I'm pretty sure I can turn you on to Van Halen as well. How the fuck was Rush an easier sell than Van Halen, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> and sooner or shows, later. That just shows what an awkward later, trick Billy I am. Billy will get you into Striper, and I'll get you into Boston. <laughs> Boston will happen. Boston will happen. Boston's an easy sell because uh, again, that first album is just so good. Striper will never happen because of the God thing. Boston's first album is one of those albums that I can guarantee you I listen to every single year without fail at least once, every year since I've ever had it. It's it's so good. That that's in a that's in the top ten all time best albums ever list. 
and the second one wasn't wasn't uh, far behind it. Bloody pretty good in its own right. It, it's pretty good, but it doesn't have the caliber. Of... No, it's, it's not I don't even know what there, it is. It's there, you know. Yeah. Is it the songs aren't as good, or they were just so good on the first album that they they were never going to top that? Yeah, well, the title tracks up with anything on the first record. I'll give you that. Totally, but actually, great song. Yeah, but I mean, you've got things like um, that first Boston album. You've got like a long time and stuff like that. Oh, I mean, that's just immense. It's like Space Age trippy as fuck and then it goes off into like metal and harmonies and all kinds of cool stuff solos for days yeah I'll definitely boss yeah. striper is never gonna happen I'm never gonna get past the Jesus thing <laughs> recorded recorded in a basement oh you did I'm down straight away straight away I'm down that's cult as fuck if you've if you've not seen if I've not showed you it before and, and we must have shared this at some point with, with each other that little thing on YouTube YouTube the the wee kind of mini documentary type thing with Tom Schultz when he goes back to the the basement thing. I, I know, I, that. Me and, I know, me and Richie have talked about this before. That this there's a little thing where he, he, they just take you back into his wee basement and show you all the the equipment he had, and he talks about how he put together the first album and like. Ah, no, I see that. Share that with me. Yeah, so he, he'd come out of like Panasonic. Was it Panasonic he worked for? No, um, Polaroid. Polaroid. And he was like an engineer and he basically started building his own studio equipment because he couldn't get what he needed and wanted sound wise, so he basically just built his own ship. So he built a studio like He built a studio that didn't exist with technology that didn't exist. I mean that's just cool as fuck. Yeah. But that's what that's where great music like, let, let's go back to Eddie. Seen as we're seen as a rip van here like, fucking mercilessly for the last five minutes. What he wanted as a, in a, as a guitar didn't exist. Yeah. So he made it. I love shit like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's when you get true, when real real art comes from you not having what you need. And you just make and do with what you've got or creating something completely new. These guys were the innovators. Yeah. And that sets them apart from just even musical level. The fact that they could... Yeah, they that's were... why you don't get a classic album anymore. Mm. Because there's no struggle. It's too easy. There's for no a lot. struggle anymore. You, you, people can knock up a record quite quickly and cheaply, whereas these you had they you were you were shackled by your limitations and you had to find ways around them. Yeah, that's kind of missing a bit now. Limitations create art, hundred percent. You need to have some sort of limit. You need to limit yourself now. K K Downing's book's quite good with that when he's talking about it as well and how they were always trying to get their guitars to well, sound way. But they just couldn't because the technology didn't exist. So they were like, they had to try and find ways of doing things in the studio to make it louder and heavier and get more dirt out of stuff, you know. And then they got that and it didn't sound as good. Yeah. That's it. With the, the advent of new technologies, do they sound better? I mean, that's no. debatable. The, the struggle sounded better. Yeah. Has anybody matched that Eddie Van Halen 1978 hand-built guitar and amp about to explode sound no oh. even ed now that he has his own line of amps and guitars do they Double sound, as sound good? That that sound good. a lot of that's a production too because of digital production i guess yeah. is probably part of it too you're not recording to a tape anymore so yeah and the old i'm Eddie. sure that's part of it but yeah i think you need to have some element of struggle to create something good something classic that'll be the last to be called a classic. I think, especially in, metal, is a, is a bad genre for it, for it, for yeah. just churning out cookie cutter shit. I've been, like, I've been struggling a wee bit, and since the quarantine started, to come up with a lot of stuff. And I've had like little spurts of writing things, but you realise when you when you're not doing anything, it's really difficult to be creative when there's no. <laughs> No, I mean, like, it's hard to be coming up with new ideas when you when your the stimulation is so low. You know, it depends on what you. It depends on the kind of music you write, I suppose. For me, I've never needed any kind of outset. Mine always comes from in my head or 
reading a book or from watching a film. It never really comes from yeah. anywhere else. Well, yeah, um, that's been the saving grace, I suppose. And I've, I've got a couple of things written, but I think I'm not slightly as... I don't know, I'm just feeling slightly stale because I'm not having to do anything like currently, you know. Probably there's a bit of lethargy kicking in yeah. too. Cause... Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm, I think I'm, I'm aiming at here. It's just the temptation to sit down is high at this point in time. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that, that that befalls a lot of artists later in their careers when they no longer have to struggle to do anything. Yeah. And everything's just... It's like what? you were saying there, I think we're talking about kind of legacy acts. Yeah. Can they make a classic album? Not really. <laughs> Not really, because the, the conditions aren't there for them to do, to yeah. create a classic album anymore. And, well, and they they were, they've tried it before Skyscraper, didn't they? They fucking they binned off everything and just moved into some wee grubby flat in fucking the middle of New York or whatever it was. Who did? They, they were off. Probably. He's mental enough to do it. <laughs> you just took yourself away. Was that, was that when he got the job as a paramedic? I think so. Yeah. That, was that, makes, that makes sense to do, as, like, artistically, it makes sense. He's, he's Joe Rogan podcast, the last one he did was quite good when he was talking about how he just moved to Japan. Yeah. Just got up and just moved. <laughs> so I'm going to go to a country where I don't speak the language and I'm going to learn and I'm going to, you know, become a student. <laughs> so I did. I just moved over there, got an apartment and booked myself in for Japanese lessons the next morning. <laughs> No, didn't, help me, didn't help me a classic album but at that point you never give a fuck anyway he wasn't bothered with music at that point anyway but yeah like testing yourself a little bit instead of just falling into the I'm now a rich rock star I have my mansion with my home studio let's just keep making the same thing over and over and over again Plus, your audience I suppose isn't really interested a lot of the time in anything you've got to say because you used to be them yeah now you're not. No. Now you're the exact opposite of them. So yeah. what, how can you relate to them anymore? A disconnect, you know. D. D. Snyder talked about that once about how he couldn't write, knew he couldn't write the next teen anthem when he was sat there in his pool, and yeah. he's like, I just had nothing to say that was going to resonate with, a, with like an angsty kid anymore. But again, it depends. It depends on where you where you stand. But if you're early John Roth, for example, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like if you if you get rich, it's still going to sound the same because <laughs> you're you're writing on a fucking different plane of thought from everybody else anyway. Yeah. If you're writing kind of fantasy rock lyrics and shit, you're golden. You can do that for as long as you want. <laughs> but if you're if you're trying to write really, if you're like, they keep going back to Metallica thing. If you've got like a Metallica <laughs> thing where it's like street rock, and then you're not in the streets anymore. If you you're can, you can't up on a hill in a gated, gated mansion, you you're done. Once your, your frame of reference is gone. Once your angstiness is gone, you can't go back to being an angsty writer anymore. Yeah. You, you, you kind of have to, if you're going to go down that route, you have to live it. Yeah. The, the, the poor me route, you have to be in a shitty situation to make it legit. If you're a, if you're a party band and you're only partying, then you're probably going to have no end of material to write about yeah. party. Because you can party really well when you're rich. Yeah. <laughs> Summarise. Yeah. Uh, what have we done? What have we spoke about? Spoke about. Hours. We've had two topics and we spoke for about three fucking hours about them. We've done, <laughs> we've done metal albums. We've done metal albums. We've done various other shit in between those metal albums. We've, we've done metal albums. We've just ventured but, off into other territories here. But I mean, this is this is plenty for this week. Uh, so what we'll do is we will open the floor to anybody who's watching. If you have any um, suggestions for topics or any questions, questions you want to ask uh, drop them in the comments or message us or anything really because we're bored and we'll just talk to you about any old shit now quite frankly well, as, as you've just experienced we can talk for three hours about absolutely fuck all oh, oh. so <laughs> give us something to talk about we'll talk for six what we might we will do at some point is we'll get some guests in and we'll invite some people to come and talk to you and us and uh We'll, we'll make that happen. You want to be the wanker of the week? Give us a line. <laughs> the rob the week. Um, we'll do the obligatory plug. If anybody would like to check out anything we are doing, please follow all of our social medias. So 
Tan from Scotland, anything, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Facebook Instagram, Bandcamp, YouTube, YouTube. Bandcamp, you can buy stuff, um, and we are all over the place. And I think that's going to be enough for this week, isn't it, guys? I think we're probably done for the old recordage. I think so. So we will do a cheers if anybody's got a drink left. And baby, and have the ball. And we will speak to everybody <laughs> next week. And maybe Swan will be back by then as well. Hopefully. <laughs> well, hopefully not. Yeah. <laughs> you can get, you can get the editing software back out again. But we will continue on with this anyway. So, right, take care, guys, and we will see you all next week. Peace out. Adios.